Ashley, did you put this on the website yet? Hello, hello. Um, I'm trying to figure out if Ashley has posted the paper onto our website yet, but I'm getting no response from the next room. We actually had the paper really early today. Um, I got it sent out on Discord, so if you want a, a copy of that, you can find it on Discord. But I'm trying to find out if... And she has left me. Left me. Well, let's check. August 1st. Let's go in here to the LDS archives. Scroll down. Click on Firesides. Open a new tab. Here we are. We're going to scroll down to the very bottom. Should... How many of these have we done? Wow. Oh, nope. August 1st. Right here. Perfect. So she's done it. All right, so we got it on Word and PDF up on the website already. Hola, hola. So today we have a lecture on faith number four, and this is a small enough lecture that I have actually the entire thing done. Um, what uh, I, I think is really important to grasp in it and some, some thoughts and have it all done. So lecture four is going to be done entirely today, August 4th, 2021 in this fireside. So we don't have, um, we don't have any guests today, but, um, it'll just be me. But next week, a uh, little bit of news. And I guess I'm going to have to repeat this. We only have 14 people in here right now, but I'm going to have to repeat this uh, when more people get in here. And that is that, uh, next week's fireside, uh, will not be on Sunday. It will take place on Saturday. And it will take place Saturday morning for Central Time. Um, and so it will be taking place at about uh, 8 or, I don't know, 7 to 9, depending on how it works out, 7 to 9 time uh, Central on Saturday. And the reason why we're doing that is because we have uh, um, Ammon and we have Topher from Australia uh, that are going to be calling in and they're going to be the guests on that fireside. And it's just, it's easier, uh, for me to do it earlier in the morning that way. Cause when, what I will be doing is I will be doing it at uh, seven in the morning to about, uh, you know, nine or 10 in the morning or in the afternoon, um, on Saturday at central time, but they will be 14 hours ahead. And so they will be actually, uh, uh, clicking in sometime between seven to 10 their time at night. So, um, that we just decided that, that would be the best way to do it. So next Saturday, we will be doing that. And as far as a topic, we're going to uh, wait on that one because uh, we're going to get the topic from uh, Topher. So Topher is going to give us a, a, the topic and, and we're going to talk about it. So um, Ammon and his brother uh, Topher or Topher, his brother Ammon. I don't know um, <laughs> how they prefer that. They two brothers. So we're going to get them and, uh, and, and uh, myself and that'll be us. But that'll be next week on Saturday. So this week, there there is no guests. It's just me. We're going to be going over Lecture on Faith, number four. Um, these are really important lectures, and I really uh, enjoy breaking these down and going over these, um, especially in a fireside format because uh, in a video, it might be a little bit more um, tedious and a little bit long-winded, and uh, you may, people might not have questions or comments or things going on as you're going through it that may or may not help as we talk about it. And so uh, what we do is we break it into the, these, this question style format and then we'll stop in between and make sure everyone uh, understands and is, is following along. So um, as always, you can find these papers for free, ad free. It doesn't cost you anything. You find them on the family website or now we're trying to mirror them over on the Discord. Um, 
we're trying to keep the Discord as organized as possible. Um, there's there's currently two Discords that this group um, is uh, is running or a part of. Um, the two LDS archives is is mostly something for people to get in contact with me and uh, for a place to put up all the papers. Big thank you to Tracy for helping us get all that uh, getting get all that on there. Um, and then there's another one called Saints uh, in Zion. Um, and uh, in order to get onto that Discord, you have to uh, uh, send an email to Blake, um, um, also known as Defending Zion. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to do that. And so, but on the Discord, you will also get all these papers and and, and things uh, provided totally for free. They won't cost you anything. You can just download them. We try to provide it in PDF and Word because we know that some people have devices that just don't uh, don't like certain things and as we have time we've been uh, uh, formatting these things into an audio file that people that can download and do whatever they want with people keep asking about um, uh, podcasts we're gonna have to look at that once we move and th i think that's all that's involved in that is changing the audio file into a podcast format that doesn't really require anything um, of a technical level uh, or te technical difficulty so that should be very hard for us to do so Anyway, so um, it is just me, but it is a fireside, and I want to make sure that I'm, you know, that we have the spirit. We're not saying things that we're not supposed to be saying, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I will have to start with a prayer and end with a prayer. Um, a lot of the times, like uh, the two brothers said, which I really appreciate they actually said this. A lot of the times you, you try to say a prayer uh, before you do you do video if you um, are not, you know, practicing priestcraft and you're not just out there to set yourself as a light you'd hopefully say a prayer before you did a video and say, Hey Lord, help me uh, speak your words, not my own. I help this be the case. Uh, and so um, you don't hear that in any of the videos because that's done before. Um, just like with missionaries, uh, missionaries say a prayer with an investigator, but uh, you know, 99% of the time they're also saying a prayer uh, as a companionship before they go in uh, either verbally or their heart. Trust me, a prayer is, a prayer is going on uh, at that time. So I'll say a prayer. We'll get into this uh, fireside. I will do the questions uh, exactly the same way, and I'll explain that afterwards um, before we move on. So, Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day. We're thankful for our many blessings. We're thankful for this technology that enables us to meet together as saints and friends around the world. Father, we're thankful for that blessing, and we pray that it will hold out as we have this fireside and that we can talk about thy doctrine um, the, the, of the Church of, the, of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Father, we pray that we can always remember thee in our lives and that we can um, remember the covenants and promises that we made with thee and, and live accordingly from day to day and we're thankful for the sacrament which we were able to take today which was one such uh, promise father we pray that we can have the spirit to be with us to speak thy words and not our own and that the technology will work and uh, we'll hold out as we do this and we pray in jesus name amen okay so The way that I've been breaking down these uh, um, lectures on faith, as it, those who are now familiar with this, we're now in lecture four. Um, as we break these things down, what, what's beautiful about these lectures, uh, as they are were designed, is that they were they, they were provided in a lecture format. So you have the the words, you know, this is the lecture, and then you have a series of of questions that were asked, and then you have a series of answers that were provided. And I absolutely love this format. This is how everyone should go about studying something. Um, this is uh, the way we should do this because we learn the most uh, uh, doing it this way. And so the way I've been breaking it down is I first um, ask or, or bring up the question. So we have a question or, or a series of questions that were asked in the back of the lecture, so lecture four in this case. And uh, so we'll ask the question first because what that does And it should be popping up on our screen shortly. What that does is it enables us to to get the question in our mind, the thought in our mind, and we can think about it, we can ponder it. And uh, then what we can do is we can go and read the lecture that they said that the answer is found in. So what they do is they'll ask these questions and then they'll say the answer is found in this part of the lecture. So we'll ask the question. And then what we'll do is we'll go and we'll read the lecture in that section. And uh, we will make sure that uh, we understand what's going on here. So. This first question is, what was shown in the third lecture? Kind of a straightforward question. I'm glad that they're doing a little bit of a recap. Um, somebody uh, somebody once uh, talked about a hinge point. Now a hinge point is when 
uh, in a lesson as people stop and make sure people are caught up. So that's kind of what you could say is going on here. So uh, lecture on faith uh, for uh, Joseph Smith, what was shown in the third lecture? That's the question. Then they send you to this part of the lecture to get the answer. Okay, so now I'm going to quote the lecture. Having shown in the third lecture that correct ideas of the character of God are necessary in order to the exercise of faith in him unto life and salvation, and that without correct ideas of his character, the minds of men could not have sufficient power with God to the exercise of faith necessary to the enjoyment of eternal life, and that correct ideas of his character lay a foundation as far as his character is concerned, for the exercise of faith, so as to enjoy the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even that of eternal glory. We shall now proceed to show the connection there is between correct ideas and the attributes of God and the exercise of faith in him unto eternal life. End quote from the lecture. So, uh, Ashley just showed up, so if you're... <laughs> I was trying to find her earlier in this, and she was nowhere to be seen. As soon as I start reading the first quote, a big creak. <laughs> so uh, Ashley has entered the building. Okay, so um, Joseph's answer. So we have the question, what was shown in the third lecture? They say, go back to the lecture, the, uh, read Lecture Faith 4 here. Now we're going to get Joseph's answer. And Joseph answers this question, what was shown in the third lecture? And he says, it was shown that correct ideas of the character of God are necessary in order to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation. And that without correct ideas of his character, men could not have power to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation. But that correct ideas of his character, as far as his character is concerned in the exercise of faith in him, lay a sure foundation for the exercise of it. Okay, so that was, um, the, we have the question, we have the lecture, and we have Joseph's answers. Now I'm just going to add some thoughts here um, as I was uh, going through this and, and maybe some things that will help clarify what's being taught here, um, that that's what my thoughts are. And as always, if you're looking at the paper, my thoughts are in blue so and clear, clearly labeled so that you can tell that that's what they are. So Joseph, this is a quote, quote, Joseph Smith holds the keys of this last dispensation and is now engaged behind the veil in the great work of the last days. No man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter into the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. From the day that the priesthood was taken from the earth to the winding up scene of all things, every man and woman must have the certificate of Joseph Smith Jr., as a passport to their entrance into the mansion where God and Christ are. He holds the keys of that kingdom for the last dispensation, the keys to rule in the spirit world, and he rules there triumphantly, for he gained full power and a glorious victory over the power of Satan while he was yet in the flesh and was a martyr to his religion and to the name of Christ, which gives him a more perfect victory in the spirit world. He reigns there as supreme, a being in his sphere, capacity, and calling as God does in heaven, end quote. And that was Brigham Young um, who said that, quote, I have uh, uh, the um, uh, references here in the paper. So when Joseph Smith teaches, quote, that correct ideas of the character of God are necessary in order to the exercise of faith in him unto life and salvation, end quote, what does that mean? And do we believe it? Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. Wherefore, I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which had come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments, end quote. So when people do not have a correct idea of who God is, they will not be able to exercise faith unto life and, and salvation. And many will then fashion gods unto themselves, made in the image of of the world and they will then follow after them joseph smith said quote i am not at all 
astonished at what has happened to you, neither what has happened to Zion. And I could tell you all the whys and wherefores of all these calamities, but alas, it is in vain to warn and give precepts. For all men are naturally disposed to walk in their own paths as they are pointed out by their own fingers and are not willing to consider and walk in the path which is pointed out by another, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. Although he should be an unerring director and the Lord his God sent him, they are blind and they lead the blind and they fall into the ditch together. They build with hay, wood, and stubble on the old revelations without the true priesthood or spirit of revelation. If I had time, I would dig into hell, Hades, Sheol, and tell what exists there, end quote. So we need to we need to understand that uh, and believe is Joseph Smith really a prophet? Uh, and if he is really a prophet, which I know he is, then is what he is what is being taught here accurate? And if what is being ac- taught here is accurate, then we need to have a correct idea of the attributes and characteristics of God, or we will not be able to exercise faith in God um, unto eternal life, unto life and salvation. Okay, I believe this. I know it to be true. Um, so that answers that question. So I'm going to have to sit back over here and I see. I don't think anybody's okay. Good. Okay. Everyone okay with that? We're going to move on to the next, next one. So that was the first question in lecture four. Now we're going to go into questions two and three. Ooh, mouse is giving me trouble. Okay, questions two and three. What object had the God of heaven in revealing his attributes to men? So what was the purpose behind it? Why do he want why do he why do he do it? Could men exercise faith in God without an acquaintance with his attributes, so as to be enabled to lay hold of eternal life? It's a good question. Why why did God do it? And um why did God do it? And if um Could men, men exercise faith in God without that knowledge? Good questions. Sends you to the lecture. Let's read the lecture. Quote, let us here observe that the real design which the God of heaven had in view in making the human family acquainted with his attributes was that they, through the idea of the existence of his attributes, might be enabled to exercise faith in him. And through the exercise of faith in him might obtain eternal life. Can we get that? So he gave us the attributes. Okay, give us the ideas so that we could then exercise faith in him. And through the exercising of them, we could then obtain eternal life or exaltation. For without the idea of the existence of the attributes which belong to God, the minds of men could not have power to exercise faith on him so as to lay hold upon eternal life. The God of heaven, understanding most perfectly the constitution of human nature and the weakness of man, knew what was necessary to be revealed. And what ideas must be planted in their minds in order that they might be enabled to exercise faith in him unto eternal life. Having said so much, we shall proceed to examine the attributes of God as set forth in this revelation to the human family and to show how necessary correct ideas of his attributes are to enable men to exercise faith in him. For without these ideas being planted in the minds of men, it would be out of the power of any person or persons to exercise faith in God so as to obtain eternal life, so that the divine communications made to man in the first instance were designed to establish in their minds the idea necessary to enable them to exercise faith in God and through this means to be partakers of his glory. So then Joseph answers the question that we're seeing uh, on the screen. The answer is that through an an uh, acquaintance with his attributes, they might be enabled to exercise faith in him so as to obtain eternal life. And he says they could not, meaning they could not exercise faith in God without an acquaintance with those attributes so as to be enabled to lay hold on eternal life. So my thoughts. Now, I basically could just reread what I just said above. 
The thing that is the most stunning for me personally, the maybe befuddling is a better word uh, here, is Joseph Smith is laying out in his life revelation upon revelation, step upon step. He is laying out the requirements that man must take in order to be exalted. He's very clearly laying it out. You must do blank in order to have life and salvation and exaltation. That's what he's doing here. Those that obtain exaltation are referred to as the members of the church of the firstborn. Now, the church of the firstborn are those who have had their calling and elections made sure. Okay, The doctrine of the Gospel Student Manual, chapter 19, teaches us, quote, Those members of the church who devote themselves wholly to righteousness, living by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God, make their calling and election sure. That is, they receive the more sure word of prophecy, which means that the Lord seals their exaltation upon them while they are yet in this life. Making or calling an election sure, continuing, is an important quest of mortal life. Then it gives you four points here. One, the elect of God are those who hear his voice and obey him. Does that sound familiar to everyone? It should be. Two, to make our calling and election sure requires diligence and effort in developing God-like attributes, right? Does that sound familiar? Something about lazy and lax disciples, right? Requiring, you know, work. And... Anyway, continuing. Number three, while many are called of God to receive his blessings, comparatively few become worthy of them. Number four, we are free to choose for ourselves, end quote. And you can find that, I provide the link uh, to where you can find that actually from the Gospel Student Manual there um, on the church website in the paper. So if you're wanting to find that in the on the church website as well as the manual, um, uh, you can find that there. The redemption of Zion and building of New Jerusalem will be done on the backs of the Church of the Firstborn. And the Church of the Firstborn are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that make their calling and elections sure. To make your calling and election sure, one must live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. Every word. Everything that's said. By the voice of his servants or his own, it is the same. Listening to and heeding the voice of the Savior is to act is the act of letting God prevail in our lives. Ultimately, individuals are responsible, however, to make their own decisions and are free to choose for themselves what they will or will not do. What is bewildering to me is how many members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have convinced themselves that lowering the standards, living by mostly or a lot of the words that proceed forth from the for, uh, the words of God uh, that proceed forth, that's enough for salvation. If members lowered the standards and pick and choose the revelations to follow, but were totally okay with ending up in the terrestrial kingdom, hey, that would make total sense to me. What makes no sense to me is believing that the church is true, believing that Joseph Smith is a prophet, believing the Book of Mormon is true, paying your tithing, doing your calling, etc., and then mostly obeying the rest, treating the rest of the gospel like a smorgasbord, selecting and choosing between which counsel to follow and eh, which counsel to ignore, or worse, which counsel to override with our own personal spiritometers. Joseph Smith is saying that if you don't even have the knowledge of God's attributes and characteristics, you won't be exalted, let alone actions that are required to follow such knowledge. Teach men correct principles and let them govern themselves. Plus, corn dodger for a wedge and a pumpkin for a beetle. Even the saints are slow to understand. Oh boy, we as a church love to quote those two quotes. But we fail to quote the entire statements that the prophet Joseph Smith was making in context at that time. And the reason why we omit the entire statements is directly tied to what perplexes me here. Quote, the question is frequently asked, asked can we not be saved without going through with all those ordinances? I would answer no, says the prophet Joseph Smith, not the fullness of salvation. Jesus said, there are many mansions in my father's house, and I will go and prepare a place for you. House here named should have been translated kingdom. And any person who is exalted to the highest mansion 
has to abide a celestial law and the whole law too. I have tried for a number of years to get the minds of the saints prepared to receive the things of God. So what is he talking about here? What's the whole purpose of what he's saying here? He's trying to get the saints ready to abide a celestial law, the whole law. He's not content with the terrestrial kingdom. He's trying to get the saints ready for the celestial laws. But he says here, but we frequently see some of them, after suffering all they have for the work of God, fly to pieces like glass. As soon as anything comes that is contrary to their traditions, they cannot stand the fire at all. How many will be able to abide a celestial law and go through and receive their exaltation? I am unable to say. As many are called, but few are chosen. Now, maybe that was a little bit overkill for one question <laughs> in this lecture on faith, but this this concept really does bother me. This constant, all is well in Zion, we received and we need no more attitude combined with an attitude or arrogance of entitlement to uh, entitlement to exaltation. We don't have to get there all at once. Nobody says that we do have to get there all at once. Nobody says we have to be perfect right at this moment. But that's not the same thing as teaching, I don't even have to make an attempt in this life. The Lord will make up the rest in grace after all we can do. Those who expect grace while doing nothing, while making no effort, and remember, as President Nelson said, the Lord loves effort. Those individuals will not find manna rain, raining down from heaven. They will be the ones saying, Lord, Lord, have we not? They will be the ones saying, this is not the work of the Lord, for his promises aren't fulfilled. But woe unto such, for their reward lurketh from beneath and not from above. There are requirements, and we are required to live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. We are required to understand. We have to know the, the characteristics and attributes of God so as to exercise faith in him sufficient for life and salvation. So that answers that question. Uh, to answer Al Aaron's question here, that's in Revelation. Oh, that's interesting. That would be in Revelation. Okay, well, we're going to go on to the next one. When it's only me talking, it seems to go really quick. I must talk too fast. Questions four and five on lecture number four. Get it up here. And like I said, this uh, paper is for free. You can download it uh, uh, on Discord or on our family website. And you can follow along what I'm reading here uh, and all these references that I'm providing that you can go check them out for yourself afterwards. So question number four and five is what account is given of the attributes of God in his revelations? And and this is another thing that I, I've gone over in the previous lectures on faith. Every time they say revelations, they're referring to scriptures. And so I, I think that's one of those times where we think, we think of, oh, revelation, revelation, revelation. And we think, okay, that means something other than what they're saying. And this is just, they mean scriptures and because Scriptures are revelation. They're revelation to man. That's what they are. And so I guess that could be another way to easily understand um, to understand the keys of God, right? Can you write scriptures for somebody else? Um, no. Can I write scriptures for me? Yes, I can write scriptures for me. It's called a journal. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's another way to easily, uh, maybe a little bit easier to understand how the keys of God work with what revelation am I allowed to, to re receive? What scriptures are am I allowed to write? Uh, very similar, very similar concepts. Continuing with the question, where are the revelations to be found, uh, which give this relation of the attributes of God? Okay, then we go into the lecture. Quote, we have in the revelations or scriptures, which he has given to the human family, the following account of his attributes, meaning God's attributes. First, knowledge. We we'll read about this in Acts 15, 18, or this is now the revelations or scriptures, right? Uh, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient time the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel 
shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Secondly, faith or power. Now, th those also get used uh, interchangeably. Faith and power are interchangeable, just like uh, revelations and scriptures are interchangeable. So, um, secondly, the thing we need to understand about God is faith, okay? Or power, but faith. Hebrews 11.3, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Isaiah 14, 24 and 27, the Lord of hosts has sworn saying, surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have pur uh, proposed, so shall it stand. For the Lord of hosts has proposed and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out and who shall turn it back? Thirdly, justice. Psalms 89, 14. Justice and judgment are the habitations of thy throne. Isaiah 45, 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from the ancient times? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a savior. Um, whoa, I, Zephaniah. I can never, I'm not going to get that right. How would you get it? Zephaniah? That's how I would go. Okay. Three, five. Somebody in the in there is going to be some Hebrew speaker and be like, you can't pronounce anything. Um, three, five. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. Zechariah, which is much easier. Nine, nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Fourthly, judgment. Psalms 89, 14. Justice and judgments are the habitations of thy throne. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Psalms 9, 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. Psalms 9, 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executes. Fifthly, mercy. Psalms 89, 15. Mercy and truth shall go before his face exodus 34 6 and the lord passed by before him and proclaimed the lord thy god merciful and gracious um nehemiah 9 17 but thou art a god ready to pardon gracious and merciful and sixthly truth psalms 89 14 mercy and truth shall go before thy face Exodus 34, 6, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right, is he. Psalms 31, 5, into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. So Joseph summarizes here and gives his answer. First, knowledge. Second, faith or power. Thirdly, justice. Fourthly, judgment. Fifthly, mercy. And sixthly, truth. In the Old and New Testaments, uh, how, so how do we prove this? So the, the question is, how do we prove this? And Joseph's answer is, we prove this in the Old and New Testaments, and they are quoted in all of what he, we just read above. So he just says, he just lists them off first this second this third this and then says we prove it with all these scriptures that i provided above now my thoughts here is that joseph didn't really feel like there was much more to expound here as he simply told the students which you'll read you'll get a little star here he just told them to memorize it so memorize all of it okay so the scriptures here i would put as gold scriptures so those that are familiar with my concept of gold scriptures um you'll get that in sharpening the sword um, I'd make all these scriptures here gold scriptures. These are gold standard scriptures that, that we should probably have marked in the scriptures as gold, and we probably should do our best to try to memorize them. But the other thing here is that these are the attributes. These are the, are the characteristics. No, attributes. These are the, the attributes of, of God, and we need to memorize them, okay? And so what I've done here is I've given you, I've written it here in, um, uh, wow, what is this called? What's this called? So I, I, it's K-F-J-J-M-T. So when you, when you take the first letter of each one of those things. So um, K, knowledge, F, faith, J and J is justice and judgment, M is mercy, and T is truth. So we got K, F, J, J, M, T. 
And I came up with, to memorize this, I came up with kingdom first, Jesus and Joseph, meet me there. So that's, that's what I, I had to, to help me remember this. So kingdom first, or like kingdom of God first. So kingdom first, Jesus and Joseph, meet me there. So K-F-J-J-M-T. So kingdom first, Jesus and Joseph, meet me there. K is for knowledge, F is for faith, J and J is for justice and judgment, M is for mercy, and T is for truth. So if somebody else in the, the chat has another better way of trying to memorize those things, just uh, let me know here. Uh-oh. Somebody's saying my, my voice is not working. Is everyone saying that, or is that just you, Aaron? Yeah, let me... There, I just unplugged it, Aaron, and plugged it back in, so maybe that'll help. Well, hopefully. Hopefully that helps, Aaron. So, um... I'm just looking here in the, in the, uh, the, uh, the, the chat here. See if anybody else came up with anything else. So, uh, it's kingdom first, Jesus and Joseph meet me there. Okay. So Jesus, Jesus and Joseph. Oh, voice good. Okay, good. So that's what I came up with. If anybody else has something else they want to come up with, you know, do whatever you can do to try to memorize those, those, um, um, attributes of God. Right. So once again, Kingdom first, KF, knowledge, faith, Jesus and Joseph, justice and judgment, meet me there, mercy and uh, truth. So hopefully that'll help us help us uh, memorize uh, those attributes that are that uh, Joseph Smith uh, uh, is teaching us here that uh, are needed for us to understand and grasp um, before we can exercise faith uh, unto life and salvation. So kind of an important thing. And uh, once again, those uh, scriptures there, I would definitely go through and um, gold them in your scriptures. And and uh, try to memorize them as, as, as best you can. Um, Establishing Zion, uh, the YouTube uh, channel that I have uh, in my recommended on YouTube um, goes through some very helpful tips on on helping you try to memorize scriptures and keep them memorized um, if you're uh, if you struggle with that or you're not really familiar with that or how you go about that uh, he has a couple videos I think just specifically on that that are very helpful for, for that so um, if you uh, want help memorizing some scripture like that that is definitely where I would go to check that out so we're going to go on to the next question here, and this is or questions. This is question six and seven, lecture four. Is the idea of the existence of those attributes in the deity necessary in order to enable any rational being to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation? Okay, he's kind of already answered this er earlier on um, and, and said, yes, it is. But th the second part of this is the important part is how do you prove it? Because then you're going to get you're going to get people probably even in the church that will say, oh, I don't think that's required. I don't need to know that or believe that. And I can still be saved in the highest degree. That was almost a Kermit. I almost said a Kermit there. Um, we got we have a lot of Kermit the frogs in our church. Just uh, I, I guess we're going to go. With, we're going to go with that. So. You know, this will help us. How do you prove it? Well, how do you prove that an existence of those attributes, knowing that in the deity uh, is is required, uh, is um, is required to ex exercise a faith in Him unto life and salvation? Okay, so let's go to the lecture. The lecture says, "Quote: By a little reflection, it will be seen that the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity is necessary to enable any rational being to exercise faith in Him." So uh, the very first thing is, if you just thought about this a little bit, <laughs> you you should be able to figure this out. For without the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity, men could not exercise faith in him for life and salvation, seeing that without the knowledge of these things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures. 
For it is by reason of the knowledge which he, the Father, has of all things from the beginning to the end that enables him to give that understanding to his creatures, by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him. And it is not less necessary that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute power in the deity or faith. For unless God had power over all things and was able by his power to control all things and thereby deliver his creatures who put their trust in him from the power of all beings that might seek their destruction, whether that be in heaven, on earth, or in hell, men could not be saved. But with the idea of the existence of this attribute planted in the mind, men feel as though they had nothing to fear. Who put their trust in God, believing that he has power to save all who come to him to the very uttermost. It is also necessary in order to the exercise of faith in God unto life and salvation that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute justice in him. For without the idea of the existence of the attribute justice in the deity, men could not have confidence sufficiently to place themselves under his guidance and direction, for they would be filled with fear and doubt, lest the judge of all the earth would not do right. And thus fear or doubt existed in the mind would preclude the possibility of the exercise of faith in him for life and salvation. But when the idea of the existence of the attribute justice in the deity is fairly planted in the mind, it leaves no room for doubt to get into the heart. And the mind is enabled to cast itself upon the Almighty without fear and without doubt and with most unshaken confidence, believing that the judge of all the earth will do right. And it is also equal importance that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute judgment in God in order that they may exercise faith in him for life and salvation. For without the idea of the existence of this attribute in the deity, it would be impossible for men to exercise faith in him for life and salvation, seeing that it is through the exercise of this attribute that the faithful in Christ Jesus are delivered out of the hands of those who seek their destruction. For if God were not to come out in swift judgment against the workers of iniquity and the powers of darkness, his saints could not be saved. For it is by judgment that the Lord delivers the saints out of the hands of all their enemies and those who reject the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But no sooner is this idea of the existence of this attribute planted in the minds of men then it gives power to the minds for the exercise of faith and confidence in God that they are enabled by faith to lay hold on the promises which are set before them and wade through all the tribulations and afflictions to which they are subjected by reason of the persecution from those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, believing that in due time, the Lord will come out in swift judgment against their enemies and they shall be cut off from before him and that in his own due time, he will bear them off conquerors and more than conquerors in all things. And again, it is equally important that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute mercy in the deity in order to exercise faith in him for life and salvation. For without the idea of the existence of this attribute in the deity, the spirits of the saints would faint in the midst of the tribulation, affliction, and persecutions, which they have to endure for righteousness' sake. But when the idea of the existence of this attribute is once established in the mind, it gives life and energy to the spirits of the saints, believing that the mercy of God will be poured out upon them in the midst of their afflictions, and that he will compassionate, he will compassionate them in their sufferings and that the mercy of God will lay hold of them and secure them in the arms of his love so that they will receive a full reward for all their sufferings. And lastly, but not less important to the exercise of faith in God is the idea of the ex existence of the attribute truth in him. For without the idea of the existence of this attribute, the mind of man could not 
or could have nothing upon which it could rest with certainty. All would be confusion and doubt, but with the idea of the existence of this attribute in the deity, in the mind, all the teachings, instructions, promises, and blessings become realities, and the mind is enabled to lay hold of them with certainty and confidence, believing that these things, believing that these things and all that the Lord has said shall be fulfilled in their time, and that all the cursings, denunciations, and judgments pronounced upon the heads of the unrighteous will also be executed in due time of the Lord. And by reason of the truth and the veracity of him, the mind beholds its deliverance and salvation as being certain. So that was the lecture. Joseph's answer is, simply, it is. And then he says, how do you prove it? He says, prove it with, with the lecture. So he doesn't go back and actually repeat. He just says, what I just read, okay? Now, my thoughts. Once again, there's a ton of information here, and Joseph simply says to memorize. He actually says to memorize everything that I just read. There are a lot of points in here, just like in previous lectures on faith, that teach us the correct attributes and characteristics of God that we have to believe in to exercise faith unto life and salvation. If we took the time to learn these things... There would not be the disputations that we currently have, whether that be in, in your local congregation, whether that be on YouTube, whether that be in your family. We wouldn't have these disputations uh, among our family um, because 99% uh, of what, we, what people dispute um, that on the revealed doctrine, um, unrevealed we shouldn't even be talking about, but of the revealed doctrine, um, we, we shouldn't be having these. There, there's clearly one side that's right and clearly one side that's wrong. And um, so how do we know it? Like, how do we know which one's which, right? Okay, well, President Joseph Ealing Smith taught, quote, if the members of the church would search their scriptures more intensely in the spirit of humility and prayer, disputations would cease among us. It seems to be a difficult thing to eliminate from the minds of some of our brethren cherished notions that are contrary to the revealed word. Many questions have been answered time and time again by those who have had the knowledge and are prepared to give the answers. Yet, the error continues ex to exist. Why is it that some members of the church grasp at every sensational rumor and apparent with apparent eagerness and delight? If the same eagerness were applied to the revelations already given, and we would heed them soberly and in humility of spirit, all would be well. The Lord has promised the church commandments, not a few, and, and revelation in their time. Yet we have some clamoring for more revelation when we have failed to keep those already given. We want our sons and daughters to know God's truth and not the vagaries of the world. And we want you to study those books from whence you will obtain a knowledge of the world the word of the Lord to us. Some of our good people read many of the books that are published today, popular fiction, so-called, but they haven't time to read the word of the Lord. Many of these books are beautiful, but often many ideas are expressed, which are only pretty words, well-connected sentences or sentiments that are like flowers blooming on the stem without root, real truth. You can gain from books that have been adopted as standard works of the church. I see too many of our people who are very much better read in the things that are written by some of the popular authors of books than they are in the things of God. They don't know one thing about the real essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't know or comprehend one thing about the rights of the priesthood and the principles of the government that God has revealed to the children of men to maintain the kingdom of God in the earth. They know more about novels than they do about the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants. Yes, far more. It is surprising to hear the multitude of questions that are continuously sent to the presidency of the church and to others of my brethren who are in leading positions for information upon some of the most simple things that pertain to the gospel. Hundreds of questions, communications, and letters are sent to us from time to time asking information and instruction on matters 
that are so plainly written in the revelations of God, contained in the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, and the Bible. And I would also add at this time, this is Joseph um, F. Smith, the first one. Yeah, this is the first one. Correct? Oh my gosh, I think this is the first one. Teachings of the present. Now you're going to have to look this up. Ashley's going to look that up over here. Because that's important because uh, at, uh, there's two Joseph there's two Joseph F. or Joseph Fielding Smiths. And, uh, and the first one, which I think this is who this is uh, speaking, um, when he said this Doctrine and Covenants, um, the uh, lectures on faith were actually in the Doctrine and Covenants. So anyway, it seems that anyone who can read should understand. Continuing with his, uh, with uh, uh, Joseph F. Smith's teachings here. We have in a, we have in the gospel the truth. If that is the case, and I bear testimony that so it is, then it is worth every effort to understand the truth each for himself and to impart it in spirit and practice to our children. This should be done every day and in the home by precept, teaching, and example. Spend 10 minutes in reading a chapter from the words of the Lord in the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, before you retire or before you go to your daily toil. Feed your spiritual selves at home as well in public spaces. End quote from um, Joseph F. Smith. So teachings of the presidents. Which one is that? That is the first. Fielding's the second one. Yep, he's Joseph Fielding's father. So there you go. So. Uh, that seals the deal on that one. So when Joseph F. Smith was saying, if people just read what is in the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Bible, when he said this, lectures on faith were part of the canonized work in the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay? So that hopefully will tie that together with what I'm trying to say here. There's only one M what? You said meet me there, but there's only like meet there. Oh, yeah. There's only one M. Yeah, I say meet me there, but like, yeah. Meet, meet me there, kind of like a catch me outside. It's kind of one word. <laughs> catch, catch me outside. It's, it's, it's like that. So it's kingdom first. Jesus and Joseph. Meet me there. <laughs> meet me there. So that's how I'm. That's how I'm memorizing it. If somebody else has another way of doing it that's uh, better for them, hey, uh, memorize those uh, another way. All right. So that sums up that one. We're gonna go on to the last uh, part. Not last. The next part. What am I at? Lecture on faith four, which is fantastic. Second to last. Eight and nine. So now we got questions eight and nine. Seems like it's a little bit low. Huh. Well, you're gonna, the prove is kind of cut off, but whatever. All right, so we're going to go on to the next one here. And the next one here is, the question is, does the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity, as far as his attributes are concerned, enable a rational being to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation? And then how do you prove it? So once again, kind of answered this in the in the past, that it is, but then really how do you prove it is, is the, the more important part of this. So um, we're going to go to the lecture. Lecture uh, says, quote, let the mind once... Uh, once reflect sincerely and candidly upon the ideas of the existence of the before mentioned attributes of the deity. So think about it. And it will be seen that as far as his attributes are concerned, there is a sure foundation laid for the exercise of faith in him for life and salvation for in as much as God uh, possesses the attributes knowledge, he can make all things known to his saints necessary for their salvation and as he possesses the attribute power he is able thereby uh, to deliver them from the power of all enemies and seeing also that justice is an attribute of the deity he will deal with them upon the principles of righteousness and, equ and equity 
and a just reward will be granted unto them for all their afflictions and sufferings for the truth's sake. And as judgment is an attribute of the deity also, his saints can have the most unshaken confidence that they will in due time obtain a perfect deliverance out of the hands of their enemies and a complete victory over all those who have sought their hurt and destruction. And as mercy is also an attribute of the deity, his saints can have confidence that it will be exercised towards them. And through the exercise of that attribute towards them, comfort and consolation will be administered unto them abundantly amid all their afflictions and tribulations. And lastly, realizing that truth is an attribute of the deity, the mind is led to rejoice amid all its trials and temptations in hope of the glory which is to be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in view of that crown, which is to be placed upon the heads of the saints in that day when the Lord shall dis distribute rewards unto them and in prospect of that eternal weight of glory which the Lord has promised to bestow upon them when he shall bring them into the midst of his throne to dwell in his presence eternally. In view then of the existence of these attributes, the faith of the saints can become exceedingly strong, abounding in righteousness unto the praise and glory of God and can exert its mighty influence in searching after wisdom and understanding until it obtained a knowledge of all things that pertain to life and salvation. Joseph's answer is yes, and you prove it by what by this section here that I just read. So this is how you prove it. He that he cites that we they cite themselves here uh, as far as this proving. This last paragraph here, for my thoughts, this last paragraph here is the one that is the most. Uh, uh, the one that hit me the hit me the most uh, when reading this uh, again, okay. In view in view of the then of these existence of these attributes, the faith of the saints can become exceedingly strong. That that part. Now, Joseph promises that the saints, if they understood this knowledge, these attributes, and had this faith, and live right, they can then become exceedingly strong, and will obtain all these blessings as they abound in good works. That was the promise. Okay, let's think about that for a moment. What does that mean? Meaning what? That means that if the saints don't understand these things and live according to them, what does that mean? So if li living according to these things will make you abound in good works, if you don't accept these things and don't live according to these things, what does that mean? Well, here's something that's really interesting. We're going to turn to Doctrine and Covenants 101. You'll be very familiar with these scriptures, but let's reread them again. And while they were yet laying the foundation thereof, they began to say among themselves, Then what need hath my Lord of this tower? And consulted for a long time, saying among themselves, What need has my Lord of this tower, seeing this is a time of peace? Might not this money be given to the exchangers? For there is no need of these things. And while they were at variance one with another, they became very slothful, and they hearkened not under the commandments of their Lord. End quote. Doctrine and Covenants 101, verses 47 through 50. Now, the lectures on faith were removed from the Doctrine and Covenants in 1921. What happened between the years of 1917 to 1967? The times the Gentiles were, was fulfilled. To have faith as the brother of Jared once again and abound in good works, etc., one must have this knowledge of God his character, and his attributes. A huge part of his attributes and characteristics were and are centered around his unchangeableness, his truth, etc. Learning of the faith as the brother of Jared and what is coming in the sealed portion, the redemption and building of new Jerusalems, the return of the ten tribes, is it not plain to see how those who have lost this precious knowledge have become unfruitful. Yea, they have become untimely figs. We must internalize this knowledge and have faith as the brother of Jared to see the miracles, to see the redemption. Yea, and fine, we must possess and internalize this knowledge before we can pr produce fruit, meat for the Father's kingdom, as it says here at the bottom of this, of this thing. In view of this, 
the existence of these attributes, the faith of the saints can become exceedingly strong. Can. Only when they have an idea of the existence of these attributes and internalize them. Only then can they can become exceedingly strong. And then they will abound in righteousness and, uh, and the praise and glory of God. All right. Uh, looks like we're cooking. So that is the second to last section of uh, lecture number four. And we are going to go into the very last section. It is going to have questions 10 and 11. And questions 10 and 11 go. Have the Latter-day Saints as much authority given them through the revelation of the attributes of God to exercise faith in him as the former day saints had how do you prove it and then it takes us back to the lecture here quoting the lecture quote such then is the foundation which is laid through the revelation of the attributes of god for the exercise of faith in him for life and salvation and seeing that these things are attributes of the deity they are unchangeable being the same yesterday today and forever which gives to the minds of the latter-day saints the same power and authority to exercise faith in God which the former day saints had so that all the saints in this respect have been are and will be alike until the end of time for God never changes therefore his attributes and character remain forever the same and as it is through the revelation of these that a foundation is laid for the exercise of faith in God unto life and salvation the foundation thereof for the exercise of faith was, is, and ever will be the same. So that all men have had and will have an equal privilege. Joseph Smith says, and the answer is, they have. So the current former, the current Latter-day Saints have just as much authority and uh, through the revelations and attributes of God as the former day saints had. And he said, how do you prove it? With the lecture, uh, what I just read, section number 19. And then he says, let the student commit those paragraphs to memorize as well. I believe that lecture number four has the most sections that have been asked to be committed to memory. And you have to understand that uh, uh, Brigham Young, Pratt, uh, both Pratt's, um, there was a ton of the early brethren that were in the school of the prophets here uh, that took these things and uh, they were in the Doctrine and Covenants, like I said, till uh, 1921, um, that had these things memorized. Uh, so just uh, just a, a ph phenomenal testament to, to the power of the knowledge uh, that this um, that this gives us. Now, um, my thoughts. I have mentioned a couple times now having faith is the brother Jared going over this lecture. I think it is only fitting that I end this fireside with a quote from Brother Hiram Andrus. And this quote from Brother Hiram Andrus I used in my paper, Faith is a Brother of Jared. And I think this is really important to, to understand this because and this question that's being asked here. And Brother Hiram Andrus says, quote, in chapter 28 of Isaiah, as he talks about the drunkards of Ephraim, and this isn't drunkard in the sense that they get it from a bottle. It's the kind of drunkardness when it says they are drunk but not with strong drink, meaning they are drunk with the ideals and the zeal and the culture of the Gentile culture, and they act on that principle, and they march by that drum beat. Then, speaking of the judgments to come upon Ephraim in that day, in verse 5, he says this, In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty under the residue of his people. Isaiah 51 is a whole chapter devoted to that righteous remnant. Note how he begins. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness. This, then, is that righteous remnant. Look unto the rock from whence ye were hewn, and the hole of the pit from whence ye are digged. Go back to your roots. See where you came from. Find out who you were. Find out what the Lord wants you to do. Look to the rock from whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit from whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham. There's an example. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. Now, this remnant is going to be left alone. They're going to sit in the dust. Many are going to say, the Lord has forsaken us. Well, what is your 
consolation. You go back to your roots and you look to Abraham and you say, I am a descendant of Abraham and the Lord is going to handle me like he did him. End quote from Brother Hiram Anders. Or you could say, go, go back to your roots and look to the former day saints and say, I'm a descendant of the former day saints and the Lord is going to handle me just like he did them. Okay. That's having faith in Brother Jared, but it's also tied directly into the, the lectures on faith here. It's a core attribute to one of the, the characteristics that, that we have to understand about God is unchangeableness and, uh, and truth unchanging. We have to understand that to exercise that kind of faith. Now, brothers and sisters, we need to wake up and learn what is required for life and salvation. Learn what is required to redeem Zion and build New Jerusalem. A central part of that is to have faith as the brother of Jared. And to have faith as the brother of Jared is to know that God won't treat you any differently than he did previous saints. So if he made previous saints move across the country, he beat beat them darn near to death, and then they finally made it to Zion, and then they said, hey, what, what do you think, that, that God was going to rain down manna from heaven when you're walking through a country full of, you know, full of food? What do you think, he was going to give you shoes when you're walking full of a country full of leather? So, you know, God won't treat us any different than he treated those saints. God is not going to require anything less from us to redeem and build Zion than he did the the, the former day saints, than the, the 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 saints of Joseph Smith's time. He's not going to... He's not going to go easy on us and hard on them. He's, the requirements are going to be exactly the same. And if we're not living at the standard that the, the, the saints were living at then, and they failed to build the new Jerusalem, what makes any crazy individual think that we've built it today? No. No. To have faith as a brother, Jared, is to know that God will not treat you any differently than he did his previous saints. A part of that also was in the previous lecture on faith is that God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't change and he's not a respecter of persons and he's grounded in truth. We have to understand this. We both now, saints today, saints in Joseph's time, saints in, in, in Paul's time, all of us, we have the same things at our fingertips, the same things. And guess what? The same requirements for us to have faith in its most plain and literal interpretations. And guess what? That that requirement for us to have faith in the scriptures, in the revelations, and their most plain and literal interpretations, it's still here. It's still a requirement for us. Brothers and sisters, learn and internalize the attributes and characteristics of God. Get rid of the debris in your life and begin to exercise faith sufficient for life and salvation. Faith as the brother of Jared. The kingdom first, Jesus and Joseph, meet me there. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, so um, any questions? Maybe we'll say a prayer and then we'll go into Q&A. Sherry, I'll answer. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway, one sec. We'll say a prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for being able to read these wonderful words that thou has blessed um, blessed us to be able to read. We're so grateful for them being delivered and written down and recorded so that we could read them and that we could learn from them. Father, we're grateful for being able to meet together as saints uh, in love and unity. And we pray, Father, that we can do all that's required for us in our daily lives to make the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem and thy kingdom a reality on this earth, Father. We love thee. We pray for the, the strength and courage to go uh, on throughout the days and weeks as we do this, Father. We're also, uh, many of us are fasting at this time, and we pray uh, for those that we are fasting for. We pray that they will have uh, increased testimony, that they will serve um, strong missions, and that they will be able to uh, recover um, from their cancer and problems that they're going through. Father, we love thee, and we're grateful for thee. And we love all those in this community. We pray for them continually, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Lisa bought uh, Lisa bought some boots to march to to New to Zion in Australia. All right, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. That is fantastic. Sherry, the um, 
Um, Blake's email is provided uh, in my Discord. So, so if you uh, if you're if you if you have my Discord here, I don't give Blake's email out to everyone. If he wants to show up to a fireside and and give out his email, that's up to him. But I'm not gonna just uh, anyway. You can get his uh, uh, his email in my Discord. So, if you uh, join the Discord link that I have in the bottom there, and you go into the About section, I have Blake's information there, and it's also easier to do it there. So, if you join Discord. Uh, if you join Discord and um, you're there, Blake is there in Discord. You can just right-click him right there and just say, hey, can I have a link to the other Discord? And he can actually just send you a direct link right there in Discord. So it's a, it's a lot easier to do than, than sending Blake 1,800 emails. It's easier just to have me provide the link that I do, and then you can join Discord, and then you can join Blake's Discord from there. It's it's just, it's much easier, and I'm not giving out Blake's email, so um, because I don't think that's okay. So um, we're gonna go into Q and A here. Yeah, so uh, it, it's still broad daylight. Short lecture this week. Yeah, I uh, it was just me, so these were just my thoughts on it. And uh, and I did provide those in in blue, and uh, so they they're there in blue, and I and I read the lecture. And by the way, this was the entire lecture. So a lot of these other ones, I've been having to cut the lecture up into multiple, um, uh, into having to cut it up into multiple different firesides because the, the lecture is just so large. This was an entire lecture, so lecture four is actually relatively small compared to the other ones, but. It's also the you know you run the, the the risk with a small lecture though that they want you to just memorize the whole thing so <laughs> it's smaller but they said memorize the whole thing so that's rough but uh, yeah so there's a lot of memorizing that they want you to do here so keys for presidency um I don't know about missionaries so Keller uh, Keller here says. Uh, I've spoken about keys for missionaries. While I agree with your thoughts on their responsibilities, these seem like stewardship rather than keys, keys for presidency. Um, no, um, this one's a little bit weird. This one's kind of changed, um, but there's never been or ever will be. There's no keys for district leaders or zone leaders so uh, you, or assistants or anything like that. They, don't, they do not hold keys. And what does that mean? It means that they cannot receive revelation. Thou shalt do, thou shalt knows. They cannot actually receive those for other missionaries. So you're a district leader uh, and you say, oh, the Lord wants you to do this, elder. I'm sorry, you're just, you're speaking nonsense. You don't have keys over that. You don't have keys over that person. Now, um, there was a change that was wrought in the introduction of mission presidents. They didn't always used to exist. Um, so, you know, a missionary was just called, he was set apart and he was sent off. And so um, that's the way it used to work. And th they would have all the keys necessary at that time. Um, there was no mission presidents. They had to have all the keys. They had to go off and they had to, to, to find people. They had to find them worthy. They had to interview them. They had to baptize them. There was no mission president. That just didn't exist. Um, then they introduced mission presidents and things got a little bit uh, convoluted because uh, they, they still wanted the, the stake to set apart um, the missionaries. And... Um, and then sent them out, um, but they don't claim that the missionaries have keys anymore. Now, this one's a little bit weird, and, and I find this change a little bit weird, but they actually do not claim that missionaries themselves have keys anymore, but that mission presidents do, and that mission presidents are able to delegate the use of those keys to the missionaries in, in their field. I, I, I Personally, I find that to be a very uh, flawed reasoning, uh, because mission presidents have keys and they're able to delegate keys to um, uh, sisters in the temple to actually do stuff. So sisters are actually ex uh, exercising uh, delegation via the temple president. Um, missionaries, uh, that's not the case. So missionaries, mi missionaries, uh, sister missionaries are not allowed to do interviews for baptism. Uh, they're not they're not allowed to do any of that. Um, and so um, they're not allowed to do those same tasks. They're not allowed to sit down and interview you for baptism. And so if it was a simply a delegation of keys, if that's all it was from the mission president, then sister missionaries should have been able to um, 
interview uh, converts for baptism since the very beginning, but they haven't been. And so uh, they're, they're, so that explanation doesn't really hold water to me. So I think there's just a little bit of confusion in the handbooks on what it says on that. And that's just my opinion on that, because if if it what if missionaries were acting purely off of delegation of keys by their mission president, then sister missionaries should also be exercising keys based off of the exact same thing, and they don't get to exercise keys. They don't get to exercise any of them. So uh, they find somebody, they, they teach them, they baptize them, and guess what? They have to hand them over to elders or somebody else to do the interview process for that baptism. So it kind of uh, shoots that whole thing, in, it, you know. And they're doing a lot of changes to the handbook and stuff like that with regarding this, so I wouldn't be surprised if they changed this. So this has been something that, that was not originally in the church when, you know, when Joseph Smith was around. This is something that was adapted as the church grew larger and larger. And so this whole concept of mission presidents, and, and it started to uh, arise when we started sending younger and younger missionaries, and we started trusting them le uh, less and less. Because, you know, the, the guy I was quoting earlier in, in this uh, fireside, President Joseph F. Smith, I believe he was the one that got sent on a mission when he was 16 and almost died on the shore of Hawaii or wherever he was. And so was that Hawaii? Polynesian Islands or something? It was Joseph F. Smith, wasn't it, that went out there and almost died on the shore? And so uh, it, people say, well, the, we're just sending missionaries younger now. Nah, we used to send missionaries on missionaries at 16 as well. So, I mean, like, uh, that that's changed too. So um, back then, no. They, they gave them all the keys necessary and said, go off, find, teach, baptize. You have all the keys necessary to do that. And so that's a little bit convoluted now. I don't know how to answer that. Um, I do know that the the uh, presidencies of in missionaries or in in missions they do not have keys so zone leader companionships uh, assistant assistance to the president they none of them hold keys over any other missionaries they don't hold any other keys more or less than any other missionary uh it, it just doesn't exist so i do know that's the case but as far as uh missionaries holding keys um i i will concede that that one is currently convoluted in the handbook and uh and i hope that they make it a little more clear because um, if they're saying that missionaries are getting or using keys via delegation via the mission president, then uh, if that was the case, then sisters should be able to do more, and they're, they're not. Just like sisters are able to do more in the temple currently. So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. Matt says, powerful words tonight. How firm a foundation. Matt was the one last time that we had to do the memorizing thing. So I'll help me remember that. That uh, kingdom first. Jesus and Joseph, meet me there. Empty. I've got to memorize that. It could be good. Okay, so uh, Gabe says, just wanted to say hi. Uh, I've been MIA. Much love to you and your brother. Hey, Gabe. I uh, thanked you in my last video, my sword. I have to keep thanking you for that idea about the um, version numbers in the, on my paper. I totally didn't, uh, I totally didn't do that. Um, uh, they didn't do that on my own. That was uh, Gabe's idea, and I think it's a great idea, and we're going to try to implement it to try to help people know when we're, we have an updated version of the paper. So uh, I really appreciate that idea, Gabe. That was uh, inspired for you to uh, suggest that to me. It's good to see you too, brother. We love you. Okay, somebody says, I found one who's watching YouTube channel this week. He has a lot of insights of the early restoration, but it's critical of the church after Joseph's martyrdom. Your thoughts? Um, I um, go over um, uh, the one who's watching really early on uh, in my paper. So um, uh, really, really early on in my paper. One who is watching is somebody that it was updated references in the number one or number two. So what ended up happening is actually I did the paper Joseph Smith to return. And I, I started looking online for anybody else who was willing to talk about it. And, and, and like I said in my paper, I only found two people. I found the, the Skousen in one of his books. Was it Joel? Which, which Skousen was it? Was Joel? Skousen? Was it Richard? Was it Richard? I can't. She actually saying it might be Richard Skousen. It, I found him in his book. And we also found um, uh, Hannah Stoddard and her family uh, for the Joseph Smith Foundation. No relation to... Um, the Stoddard, other Stoddard on YouTube, Jody Stoddard, no relation at all to them. Um, so anyway, it was the, the Joseph Smith Foundation and uh, this um, Skousen were the only two people that, that even talked about Joseph Smith's return. I found that just shocking. I mean, it's just, it's all over the place. It's all over in the Journal of Discourses. It, it's right there in the Book of Mormon. 
And so when I was writing this paper, Ashley started looking on YouTube for other people who were talking about it, and she found one who was watching. And uh, I reached out to him, and, and this was because that was literally the first um, paper or video that we watched of theirs. And so um, because we were looking for, for that topic. And so we found it, and I commented in his comment section. I said, holy cow, this is you know, really good. Um, I, ri I had written this paper that I had written over here, you know, you know, forever ago. And, uh, you know, I'd like to reach out and have some more thoughts on it. And, uh, he then, uh, accused m me of plagiarizing him, which is interesting because when I did my Joseph Smith's return, uh, I used about 75% material that he never even used. Most of his material was centered around Signe Rignan returning. That was uh, most of his material. 99% of my material was based directly out of Third Nephi, which he never even used. Like he never even, oh, and the words of Joseph Smith, which he never even used. So, uh, you know, so I thought it was really weird. He thought I plagiarized him on this, but, you know, with something that, with words he didn't even use. But so anyway, and then he went on to say that it was a shame that um, I'm still a member in good standing. And I went, what does that mean? So we looked into it a little bit further. We found out that uh, one who is watching is no is not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's there, there. Him and his wife are clearly not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But it doesn't seem like there are LDS either. They seem like that they were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that became disgruntled, and 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 followed the same line of reasoning that a lot of members do, which is why I'm so, which is why I get so. Um, uh, I don't know what the word is, defensive, aggressive, whatever people want to use, uh, tr triggered as uh, Daniel likes to say I am, um, when people like to talk about how wonderful Emma is um, and how uh, awful Brigham is and how, uh, and just try to stir doubt about uh, the the revelation, Dr. Cummins 132, um, because it's all the same series of, of things. You, you start to preach that Emma's the best thing ever. You start to pre, and then you start to preach that plural marriage was an awful thing. And then you start preaching that Brigham Young is an awful person. And all, all of a sudden, it doesn't take very much more convincing to say, hey, you know what? <laughs> Why are you even a member of the church? Right? Uh, leave. Because, uh, you know, it, and then you start getting into really crazy conspiracies like Brigham Young killed Joseph Smith. And so, anyway, one who is watching, I don't think he's actually RLDS. I think he's just a disgruntled member of the church who's now apostate, who's left the church. I don't think he goes to any church, but he definitely believes that Doctrine and Covenants 132 never came from Joseph. He believes that Joseph never was uh, uh, married uh, in any kind of uh, plural marriage for time or eternity. He believes that was all a lie. That was all somehow all made up. He believes that um, when, when Joseph Smith returns, he's going to come back with Sidney Rignan, and he's not even going to come for the church. Like, he, like, the church is just, you know, way off. So uh, I warn people of him in my uh, updated references one or two, um, there's people that I've gone back way, way, way long ago. So one who's watching as well as Doctrine of Christ, the DOC crowd, um, they're, they're both crowds that, that are very anti the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Keys, um, that, that's, been, that's been going on for over a year now. Like maybe, I don't even know how long I've been doing this. It's been going on a long time. And so um, people know where I stand. I stand with the keys. I stand with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I believe Joseph Smith is coming back. And in fact, I would say I know he comes. he's coming back. But I also believe he's coming back for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's coming back for the righteous remnant in the church. Just like um, um, Heber C. Kimball said, you know, then Joseph will come and he will return and gather up those who have remained faithful. And they will be selected to go and redeem and build a new Jerusalem. Th that's where I'm grounded. I... I I, I, if the keys tell me to jump, I jump. And I've been very clear on that since day one. That's my belief. People don't like that, fine. This is my belief. My belief system is when the, when the keys tell me jump, I need to jump. Uh, and I, I ask questions second, right? The keys don't tell you to jump very often. They just don't. But when they do tell you to jump, jump. Um, the rest of the time, it's up to you. So when the keys aren't talking, then you need to be, uh, you need to be walking. So, and when the keys tell you to jump, jump. That's, that's been my belief. Pretty clear on that. Um, Hopefully that makes sense.
trying to scroll up here. Okay, so um, Prudence and Thanksgiving. This is uh, Car Inna, if I'm not mistaken. Hopefully I remembered how to pronounce that. Car in a Garage, as she said. Car Inna. Um, by saying that Joseph Smith Jr. still holds all the keys of this dispensation. Yes, he does. President Nelson then has keys, but not the same keys. Um, I will believe that he has all of the same keys, but they're they're based off of a hand-me-down uh, delegation from Joseph Smith. So I... I I believe he still has all of the keys, but having all the keys doesn't mean you get to do something, right? So, like, um, um, if President, if President Nelson, see, right now, President Nelson has the keys via uh, hand me down from Joseph Smith to call the ten tribes home, right? Those were given by Moses, right, in 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 the Kirt Kirtland Temple, <laughs> okay. So the, and they were passed down to President Nelson. He has them, but that doesn't mean that he's going to exercise them. And what do I mean by that? We we do in this life what we have been anointed and foreordained to do in the previous life, okay? And Joseph Smith Jr. was foreordained and anointed, and then promised in this life to be the one to do those things. So do I believe President Nelson still holds those keys? Absolutely, 100%. He holds those keys. Do I believe he will ever be the one to exercise them? I don't I don't think so, okay? I believe Joseph Smith is going to come back and he's going to be the one to do those because they were promised to Joseph Smith, okay? Do, do I believe that, for example, do I believe that there was a number of people that held the Melchizedek priesthood? Yes, but for some reason, Peter, ja uh, Peter James, and John were the ones that came and, and restored it to Joseph Smith. Why? Well, because they were foreordained, and they were anointed to do that in this life, and they remained worthy, so they got to have the privilege of doing it. I, I don't. I, I refuse to believe that 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 Peter, James, and John were the only people that had the Melchizedek priesthood to be able to do that. I, I refuse to believe that. In fact, John the Baptist. Why did John the Baptist get to do it? Why Why didn't Aaron get to do it? You're telling me Aaron didn't have those keys? Of course, Aaron had those keys. So why did Aaron was the first? So why didn't Aaron come and restore the Aaronic priesthood? Why was it John the Baptist? Well, because there are things that we uh, that just holding the keys isn't enough, right? Holding the keys isn't enough. I have the keys over my family, but until the Lord says, Micah, you need to do something, my keys are they don't they don't mean anything until the Lord gives it validation. The Lord gives it validation through preordination and anointment and our uh, obedience in this life. So President Nelson has them. Uh, I don't believe that he's going to ever exercise them because I believe that I know because I can read Joseph Smith's patriarchal blessings. I know that Joseph has promised to do those things. And so Joseph's going to be the one to exercise those keys someday in in calling home the 10 tribes and, and doing those things. But do I believe that President Nelson has all of the keys? Absolutely. Do I believe all of them have all of the keys? Yes. But only one of them are active at a time. And that time right now, it's President Nelson. So, so Stuart says, if the time of the Gentiles is past, not the times of the Gentiles was fulfilled. There's a difference. The times of the Gentiles was fulfilled. Why are we still doing missionary work to Gentiles? That's the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled and the times of the Gentiles ending are, are two different things. Big topic. Um, uh, Kim here says, do you have a paper on celestial laws? Or you talk a little bit about these laws. He said about calling an election made sure we must live these laws. Okay, celestial laws are anything that uh, are required to to live in the presence of God. Those are the, the his laws. So celestial laws are, uh, you have to understand them as more of a circle within a circle within a circle. Meaning, um, meaning think back to when you, you hope, if you've gone to the temple, think back when you've gone to the temple. If you haven't, this will become a lot more clear when you go to the temple. You know, when, when we when we get baptized, when we join the church and we get taught those first things, right? The first principles and ordinances of the gospel are what? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second repentance, third baptism by immersion, fourth. Okay. You know, when we do that, that doesn't change. So is that a celestial law? Absolutely. So everything of, of a lower law gets gets rolled into the upper law. So so there is nothing that's actually lost, Right keeping the commandments, thou shalt not uh, steal, thou shalt not bear false wit witness, right? Those are the 10 commandments, right? Moses had higher laws. 
probably you could say he had the celestial law. I think there was a very good chance Moses was marching off that mountain with the celestial law and then was given the Ten Commandments instead. That's just my personal belief. He was definitely given a higher law. I, I, I can't imagine that there, there was maybe there was an intermediate. I think it was the celestial. He brings it down. It gets it, it, the the t stone tablets, not the commandments. Thank you, Tracy. Gets broken, so the stone tablets gets broken, and he comes back down with the Ten Commandments. Okay, so all the the, the celestial law, all of the lower laws get 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 brought into it. So they're all part of it. We learn a lot about the celestial law in the temple. Okay, we learn a lot about it there. We commit to do things in the temple, right? In the temple, as part of that. Huge, I would say the, 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 the two huge things that people need to wrap their head around as far as the highest degree of the celestial kingdom are the things that we do in the temple, okay? And the two things that we do in the temple are we get we get uh, sealed um, to one another and we commit to law, live the law of consecration, okay? We do both of those things in the temple. So we, we commit to give all of our time, talents, efforts to the building up of the kingdom of God. That's that's in essence in very spirit the law of consecration. We're currently not living the financial aspect of it as fully as we will be required to someday. Currently, we're just being told to pay a generous fast offering and our a ten percent tithing, but that'll that will change, and that's part of celestial law. And the other part of celestial law is celestial marriage. So uh, to the the two big, you know, climaxes, the two big things on the top that crown people um, into celestial law, uh, I, I think that are most easily represented in celestial marriage and the law of consecration. Those are the two big ones. And so I have a paper called, um, do I have it called celestial law? What do I call it? Yeah, I do call, I have a paper called, so I have a paper called celestial law. You can check it out. And I do talk about celestial marriage and I do talk about the law of consecration. Um, there's a lot of good talks out there by uh, about uh, the law of consecration. And then there's an awful lot of talks about the law of consecration that are completely speculative, um, and I think are given in a in in a very a spirit of pro capitalism, pro free enterprise, and uh, and because of that, I, I think that they go a little bit too much into speculation versus uh, what the Lord has actually taught about it and what we actually know about it in the standard works. So the law of consecration is one of those ones that I would just say. Uh, pay your tithing, pay a generous fast offering, and be ready, like President Eyring said, be ready to walk away from everything else. And if you're ready to walk away from everything else, you can live the law of consecration. Meaning if the Lord said, hey, come take, give give me your house, give me your car, give me some food, right? Like if you're willing to give any of your, or give me some time, come on, if you're willing to give whatever the Lord is willing to ask of you, uh, you are you will clearly be able to live the law of consecration, right? You'll clearly be able to live that law. As far as the uh, uh, celestial marriage, I would just say go back and read uh, Dr. Thomas 132 or go watch my video um, on celestial marriage. And those are the two big ones that we're going to have to wrap our, our, we're going to eventually have to wrap our, our mind around because uh, many, many prophets, as I've quoted in many of my papers, have said, if, we are, if we're not willing to live united according to the united order and uh, in the law of consecration and if we're not willing to abide by celestial marriage as taught originally that we will never go back and redeem and build new jerusalem so there's plenty of prophets that have said that and and plenty and people keep asking me um will we have to live it before it happens and and i don't know that and the prophets didn't know that because i was quoting i believe it was lorenzo snow who said will we have to live it or will there be a perfect willingness to live it i you know i don't know and so it's one or the other we either have to be living it or we have to have enough saints perfectly willing to live it before we get the redemption of zion in the building of new jerusalem so hopefully that makes sense you scroll up okay jordan says it's time for some sunday night micah all right jordan well hopefully Hopefully it's beneficial and edifying. And like I said, I, I, I would I would much rather have it have this experience bribed over a barbecue, right? So that way when I have it, you know, when I'm speaking and it's my annoying voice, that you can be like, mm, Mike is annoying, and I can be like, here, have a bratwurst <laughs> or something. Uh, but uh, yeah, someday, someday. Well, we're going to the states soon, so maybe if some some of you drive up there, we'll I'll barbecue some, you something or make you something. You know, that'd be a much more uh, peaceful environment than over electronics. I, I would assume I'm more of a nature guy. Um, Keller says, uh, reading lately, it seems that the fullness of the Gentiles is different than the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. 
fullness seems to deal with Christ and Zion. Thoughts? So um, the fullness of the Gentiles um, is just them having the fullness of the gospel. And so when when um, Moroni was talking to, to Joseph Smith, he said that the fullness of the Gentiles was about to come in and that um, and Joseph was going to bring it about. And, and so I have that in, I have it somewhere written. So Moroni says that to, 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 to Joseph. So the times the Gentiles reaching its fullness um, is something that, that in almost certainty reached a point in time when Joseph was alive. So, you know, most likely at, at around the time of the Kirtland Temple, when all of the rest of the keys were restored and on the earth, uh, it might have been at the time when Joseph rolled the keys of the kingdom onto the 12 and said that I've, I've rolled this, you know, onto you. It might have been at that time. Uh, and now it, we've entered into the fullness of the times of the Gentiles. Um, so that that was promised to have taken place shortly after or in Joseph Smith's life. And so we have the times of the Gentiles actually started way back with Peter. Um, President uh, Benson at one point in time said that the times of the Gentiles started uh, with the restoration. And um, what he and that's just not accurate. So what started there was the the started was the beginning of the fullness of the Gentiles, not the times of the Gentiles. And there's actually it's there's actually a quote in the uh, LDS student manual that actually Joseph President Joseph Ewing Smith said the times of the Gentiles started with Peter. And uh, and that's clearly when the times of the Gentiles started. So what, what does that mean? When Peter had the revelation that, that, that the gospel would go forth to the Gentiles, that began the times of the Gentiles. So um, that's when the times of the Gentiles began. The times of the Gentiles reached its fullness in Joseph Smith's lifetime. The times of the Gentiles was fulfilled um, uh, sometime you know, between 1917 to 1967. Times of the Gentiles ends uh, at a future time period. And, but if we're looking for the time period of when the Times of the Gentiles ends, I mean, that's way late. I mean, that's one of those things where people are like, oh, I'm waiting for the Mount of Olives. And it's like, well, if you're waiting for the Mount of Olives, you've missed all the important stuff. All the important stuff is tied to the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem. And if you've missed that, uh, then, you know, the Mount of Olives will mean, you know, will mean spit to you because you'll probably already be dead. So we don't want to be focused on that. Well, the Times of the Gentiles has been fulfilled and uh, and so the, t the generation has been identified and uh, all the rest of it's pretty much moot. Um, I have a couple papers on that. Um, Brother Hiram Andrus also explains how the Times of the Gentiles was fulfilled um, uh, no later than 1967. So hopefully that makes sense. I, a lot of those words are, are, are words we use interchangeably all the time and we shouldn't. And, and I'm guilty of that like the rest. So when I say the Times of the Gentiles have ended... Somebody should slap me because I'm not saying I'm not. That's not accurate. But the times of Gentiles has been fulfilled, and so th there's a lot of different terminology and wording that we kind of use interchangeably. But but anyway, so as far as the times of Gentiles ending, like when people talk about that, what they're, what they're talking about is missionary work ceasing among the Gentiles, and when missionary work ceases among the Gentiles, that the reason why that occurs is because the judgments of God are being poured out. That's the reason why that happens. And the judgments of God, according to Isaiah and, and all of our LDS uh, the, uh, theology, the reason why the, the judgments of God begin to be poured out occur after the anointing. We learn about that, the word, the anointing, in Isaiah. So we, we don't get the Lord going on offense until after the anointing, right? That's when the seventh seal uh, is open. I know that's going to blow people's mind but if, if they haven't been paying attention, but... Um, the anointing takes place in the new Jerusalem. So, um, you know, that's when Christ comes and he is crowned king of kings. Christ doesn't go on the offense until that time and start pouring out judgments. As Nephi says at that time that the Lord will then at that day, he will preserve the righteous, even if it means destroying the wicked by fire. That's when we start having that. And the reason why that the missionaries and stuff are getting, being called back from the Gentile countries is because Christ begins to pour out judgments upon those Gentile co countries in the form of destruction, right? And that's why we need to have the 144,000. That's why we need to have them purified in the temple so that they can then go out, only them, right? Missionaries get pulled back, 144,000 go out. And the reason why the 144,000 go out and the missionaries come back is because the 144,000 are those that can stand forth in the midst of these plagues and judgments of God as they're being poured out and are not overcome by them, right? That's um, the quote from uh, Pratt, so... That makes sense. Okay, good. Um, 
question here. Great job. You pronounced it completely. All right, good. Thank you for your answer. Um, I understand that a lot better now. Uh, for nation, gotcha. This makes a lot more sense. Okay. Somebody asks here, I don't know if they asked it to me, but I'm, I'm, it's the question right below it. Um, it wasn't to me, but do you believe the keys will sustain Joseph when he returns? Or is that when rips the carcass in half? I have no idea on that one. Um, I think some of the 12, like Aaron says here, might. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, once again, I, I, I highly doubt that the majority will. I think that there, see, and here's the other thing. There's nothing, there's nothing in the prophecies of God that, that says that, that all of the 12 apostles and the prophets will be, will, will be kept safe at the same time. There's nothing that says that. And so we haven't had an experience like that. We haven't had an experience where like, uh, what, what was it? Like five years ago or something that like three apostles died within like a short period. Was that like seven years ago or something? Five years ago. And, and the church was like, whoa, this, this was weird because this hasn't happened before. But that used to be a big thing early on in the church where like five apostles would just go apostate. And so, um, but with us, I don't think it's so much apostasy. People keep asking about that. Who's going to, you know, it, it, will apostles fight against Joseph? I don't think so. I think what's more than likely is going to happen is that you might have a lot of apostles because they are so, we have a group of very, very old apostles. I mean, our, our first presidency, I mean, if people thought about that, we have a combined age wisdom of those three men of 270 years, almost 300 years worth of experience just between those three men. I mean, I mean, they are, they are so old. I mean, you could have all three of them dying in a weekend. And so I think that I think that that's much more likely than than them fighting against Joseph. I, I just, I don't, I, I, you know, I'm not going to say anything more on that because um, somebody's going to get mad at me. But I, I don't see, I don't, I see maybe certain people that I have my eye on might have problems with it. I don't think the majority of them would. Um, scrolling here to another at this one says one who's watching and others also believe that Peter, James, and John did not restore the milk as a priest, but that happened at the Morley form. They also believe John the Baptist is Elijah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I frankly did not uh, go that much into them. Once I realized that they were anti, once I realized that their purpose was to get people in the church and bring them out of the church, I, I, I want nothing more to do with them. Okay. I mean, that I'm, I'm pretty straightforward with that. I, I told people I don't have a speeding ticket. I don't have a parking ticket. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty, I, I put the speed, I put my uh, cruise control right at the speed limit. That's just how I roll. Uh, when somebody's trying to take people in the church and bring them, you know, another thing is a huge part of my life and the joy I found in my life is getting people that are in the slums, getting people in sin, getting people in, um, uh, terrible situations and, uh, and, and getting them in the church, getting them washed in baptism and bring them in the church. That's uh, uh, like, you will never, like one of the, I don't know, maybe some other people will, will feel the savior closer in other times in their life. I haven't. If I think of the times I felt the closest, like I felt like I could turn around and see Jesus walking with me is uh, whenever, and that's before or after my mission, um, whenever I'm doing missionary work, whenever I'm going off genuinely trying to represent Jesus in a positive way and bring people into the church. And so anybody that does the complete opposite, that, that tries to get people in the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints and get them out. I, 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 yeah, I, I walk away I, really, really quick. I, I don't, I don't deal with that well at all. Um, not my cup of tea. And so once I figured that out, I'm out. Um, I have no idea what will, uh, will end the time of the Gentiles. I think we're, I think, I think it'll be as simple as just, Hey, average Robbie, how about that? <laughs> so anyway, Stuart, to answer your question, I've actually thought about this recently a little bit about being called to the courts of Washington and the building of New Jerusalem and stuff like that. I think a very, a very good plausible of what could happen is I think President Nelson could come out or any prophet could come out and say, hey, we're going to go back and we're going to build New Jerusalem. And we're going to, over the next 10, 20 years, we're going to get, just vague, you know, it doesn't have to be specific, um, we're going to get every member worldwide and we're going to try to get them and bring them into the, the new Jerusalem, right? That's what we're going to do. Like that, that is our end goal to some degree. They come out and say that, or, or it's perceived to be that. 
What then ends up happening is I believe the United States government says, no, you can't do that. And not just because they're going to say, oh, you're going to bring people from out of the country. I think that that would just scare any government when they say, hey, we're going to get all of our members and we're going to plug them into one location. That stuff, I mean, maybe in the early part of the United States of America, but now the United States of America and most Western countries are, are more police states than anything. They're not going to be okay with with – uh, oh, we're gonna create a headquarters right smack dab in the middle of America. So I don't. I think that's all that's required. They say, hey, we want to do this, and by the way, we own the land. We bought all this land, and so we're gonna go build this city down here. And I think the United States government says, no, um, we're not gonna allow you to do that. And you say, well, how would they allow you to do that? Not allow you to do that. Well, they just say we're not gonna zone it. We're not gonna allow you to put septic tanks in. We're not gonna let you do X, Y, and Z. So you can't build that city. Right? And then I think this is when you have the call to the courts of Washington. You have the leaders of the church going into the, the, the courts of Washington. Obviously, uh, the law of consecration and the law of celestial marriage in its fullness would also probably be tied into this somehow. And they say, no, you can't, you can't do it. Well, then you end up the, have the leaders walk back to Utah, and then you have the judgments get poured out on, on Jackson County, and then you have the redemption of Zion and the building of it. And so I, I, think, that, I think that once those things start to escalate, I, I don't. I think that you're going to have the Gentiles, just like Brother Harm Andrew said. I think when these things start to happen, um, I can't. Th th there's people, are, as Brother Harm Andrew says, people are going to have to take a stand one way or the other. They're going to have. They're, everyone at that day is going to be hearing about the church, and they're going to have to take a stand one way or another uh, against it. And I think that when countries start taking st strong stances against the church because of this this freedom and yada 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 and what we're doing i think that's when you're going to start to see um you know the gentiles ending right like literally getting wiped off maps that's when that's going to start to happen um and by the way that happens after the, the anointing which we've already talked about so tomahawk wife asks in understanding isaiah 10 it seems before the seventh seal opens the earth will achieve some type of globalism, new world order, as the saints' burdens are eased from the Assyrians. The answer to that is uh, the, the answer to that is that yes. So people will be going into there will be two different groups, and so continuing with my line of, of reasoning, there's that redemption and building of New Jerusalem, and um, they're going to be the building of New Jerusalem, but not all the saints worldwide will be going in there, and we need to get the center place pure enough so that Jesus can make that city a city of holiness. We need to get that temple built, and we need to get that city pure enough that that, um, that Jesus uh, can come and be crowned king of kings in that city. Once that happens, then the Lord can go on offense. But but what you're saying is true, that there will be a an Assyrian influence that will be affecting the whole church worldwide um, and eventually will get even to the neck, meaning it will almost get to the point in time where it can take out the new Jerusalem. In theory, the anointing will take place. The Lord will go on offense. And um, these people that dug these pits for the new Jerusalem and for the saints, they're going to, they're going to fill the very pits that they dug. That's how the, the scriptures play out. So, uh, One who's watching, never heard of it before. Creepy name for a religious-based channel. Yeah, I kind of view um, watching or one who is watching or watchers. I view all of those as kind of creepy old men things. So, so. <laughs> uh, but I hear if you put it on a hat, it's less creepy. Um, I would, yeah, Aaron, uh, Joe Biden does seem to be in really bad health, doesn't he? And it, it, you, it's so weird, right? It's so weird. It's so weird that that generation is still that, that those three men are still alive from that generation, right? 90 years old. Like that's not, they're not boomers. They're not boomers. Those they're part of the greatest generation. They're old timers. And uh, yeah, they're still kicking it. It's amazing that, um, I mean, president Iring is a little bit, um, he gets tired, but his mind is still there. Like I, I, I don't, I don't see that being a problem and Oaks and president Nelson. Yeah, they stand up and it, it is like crisp. Uh, so no, they, their mind is still really sharp. And so that's, uh, that's lovely. And so, no, I, I completely agree, but that seems to be the way it typically worked with a lot of these prophets. I feel like they seem really, really healthy, f at least in my lifetime. And then all of a sudden they're just gone. Like, it's never like, Oh, so-and-so struggling with health eight months later. It's always like, Oh, did you hear? 
Like, I remember, I remember when Gordon B. Hinckley died, it was like, we, I didn't hear anything. And then my mom just walked in one night and was like, Gordon B. Hinckley died tonight. And I was like, whoa, I was not expecting that. So, uh, yeah, I, it's a little bit different. Like, everyone's seeing Joe Biden die in slow motion, right? Like, everyone's seeing that happen right now, and everyone's feeling really bad about it. No one's seeing that, I don't think, with President Iring, Nelson, and, and Oaks. I mean, you can see them getting old, but they're not dying. They, I mean, they still have so much health and and vitality, and, and mo mo most importantly, their mind is still really sharp. So, um, Keller here says, any thoughts on Hinckley saying Joel had been fulfilled? I can't make any sense of it. Oh, now that's one that's been talked about a lot in the Discord, and, and Brother Harm Andrus actually also talked about that one as well. Um, that one, um, President Hinckley said Joel 2 has been fulfilled, and then he read from those verses so we read from like what you're saying 28 to 32 the problem with that is that some of those verses in there have to deal with the great and dreadful day some of those verses have to deal with the mount of olives some of those verses have to deal with a lot of different things and so um we can't just take that and say jo uh, president hinckley said hey the second coming's happened like th that can't be what he said because it didn't happen jesus didn't appear uh on the mount of olives he didn't split it like none of that happened and so um we can't say that happened. So what we have to do is we have to say, okay, some of that's been fulfilled. Some of it hasn't. But the problem is, is that President Hinckley never said this part of it's been fulfilled and we're waiting for the rest of it. He just said, this has been fulfilled and read the whole thing. That's a problem because I don't know, you know, uh, you know, one group will say, well, I don't believe the Mount of all event has happened. So I'll draw the line right here and say, President Hinckley meant everything from here to there. And the other group will point at it and say, well, no, none of these things have happened either. I'm going to draw the line here. And so uh, due to imprecise language and due to a poor um, a poor um, referencing, we, we can't take anything from that. Because if you take from that that certain parts of it's fulfilled, you're going to have to take that the whole thing's fulfilled. So you're gonna, if you're going to have to, if you're, if you're going to believe that, then you're going to have to believe everything's already happened somehow. And so that's just not the case. There's There's been some really good breakdowns of, of the entirety of Joel 2, 28 through 32 by Brother Harm Andrus and, and others in the Discord. So so you can just read those verses. Re read Joel 2, 28 through 32, and you realize that, that some of those things clearly haven't happened. Um, clearly haven't happened. And so it's just, it's just a, a question of what has happened and what hasn't happened. And uh, for me, my personal belief, and Brother Harm Anders is very similar, is that uh, is that uh, that it was probably closer to the beginning part of that that the 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 the, are the young men are beginning to see visions, and the the old the you know the or is it the old men begin to see visions, and I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. Your young men will see visions, and your old men well, what is that? Hook me up on that one, babe. But yeah, that one's been answered uh, pretty thoroughly in the Discord by other places. You'll also find it on my uh, Keller. You'll also find that on my family website. So if you go to my family website, you go to Q&A. Uh, what was that? It sounded like a rat. On, was that Ben in the closet? Unbelievable. Okay, so <laughs> kids in the closet scaring me. Okay, so um, what was I going to say? Okay, yeah, you go to my family website. You go to the section that says questions and answers, a little picture that has a bunch of people raising their hand. You click on that on my family website, and you could go in, and you'll see a bunch of questions and answers. Uh, if you do it on your phone, on your phone, it'll be a little more difficult, but if you do it on a PC, once you get to that page, just click Control-F, just do a search of the page to find, and then type in exactly what you just typed in there, Joel 2. That's all you need to type in, Joel 2. And you'll just go into the Q&A. Somebody else has asked this exact same question. So the, the, Joel, the Joel thing is, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Okay, and upon the servants, blah, 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 blah. So my, my, uh, my belief is that he probably meant that. So when he said this has been fulfilled, he's talking about, earlier on uh in those verses so verses 28 maybe verses 29 uh but he doesn't mean the rest and brother um Hiram andrus came away with the same conclusion and so because you can't you can't say he meant the entire thing because uh, we aren't saying that the second coming has happened yet and that you know the jews and uh, we, we haven't said that and so that hasn't happened yet so once again go to my family website you 
click on the question in the answering section and then uh, go into it and then click control F and then type in Joel 2 and it'll take you to where the question was asked and then my answer to it and you'll find Brother Hiram Andrus's response because I provide that there too. So I provide Brother Hiram Andrus's response and then my own. And so, because um, I know a lot of people in this group really like Brother Hiram Andrus, so I like to use him whenever I can. So he, his response is also provided there. Uh, it'd be interesting to Stuart asks. It would be interesting to know how the church would purchase land for the New Jerusalem. Maybe they have a receipt from a Pioneer Day. What do you think? I think they're uh, in the process of buying a lot of land already, and so I think that's already taking place. And uh, so I think that's already in the process. We're already in the process of buying a ton of land, and uh, uh, so and the Saints already bought a bunch of land, and then were denied it. That uh, Ors was that Orson Hyde, that Orson Hyde talk, talk that I, I went over in the uh, the Watchmen, where Orson Hyde was that it? Orson Hyde, and he said that uh, we still own that land, that uh, the the because we bought it, it doesn't matter what the government says, we bought it legally, and uh, and we were we were forced to sell it at a, like whatever a redress or something under basically gunpoint, which means it's not legal, and so um, no. We've, I think we've pretty successfully bought most of that land twice now. So, so I think that's already done. Aaron says, President Benson was out of sight for five years before his death. That was before my time, man. That was odd. It was 1982. President Hinckley was added as a third counselor because Kimball, Marion G. Romney, and Eldon. Yeah, see, that was before my time, man. Uh, President Benson, uh, like I think... Uh, President Benson and, I believe, uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie both died around 1985, and that's when I was born. So, uh, Before my time, but yeah, that, that was a little more common. Definitely not in my lifetime. Tanner, we're so old and not able to attend General Conference. Oh, Elder Tannen, we're, not, we're so old and not able to attend General Conference. Yeah. Yeah, never, never explained that. That's in 1982. I was born in 1985. So my, my lifetime, I've just never experienced that. President Hinckley was the public face of the First Presidency from 1982 onward. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was born in 1985, so most of my life, I, I was known, of, known about him. That was pretty much it. All right. That's pretty crazy. Well, do we have any other questions? This has been fun. Do you have any more questions in here? 80, 80 people in here? We only got two hours. That's fascinating. Did that really quick. Burn through a ton of ton of good questions. Was there any more questions? In case people are still asking about it, so you uh, or are not sure. Uh, the link in the, the, if you click on the description box of this stream, uh, you can get the, uh, the link to the discord and that'll take you to the two LDS archives discord, which is where I, I post a lot of these, or all of these videos and papers in there now, thanks to Tracy. And so, um, and from there, if you're in there, Blake or also known as De defending Zion is also uh, a member of that. It's really easy. You just click on his name. You right click it and you just send them a message and say, can you send me a link to the, the Saints in Zion Discord, which is just another one in there. That's that's really easy for you to do and it's all in the Discord. Uh, very easy to do. So, uh, Prudence of Thanksgiving, I listened to the fireside about the dreams or, of mission calls. I never went on one, but I've had a lot of vivid dreams of certain future situations. It feels like the redemption. You know, there is... I. Uh, you know, there's been people, and, and I don't mind sharing it because they've actually come on here on Firesides and shared it, such as such as Brett, who have um, shared shared things that they've seen, and they didn't even know what they were they were looking at. And I don't mean to offend Brett, but it's like he didn't he didn't even know what he was looking at. He didn't even know what he was uh, he was seeing, and he he told it to me, and I said, "Holy cow, you have just seen the redemption of Zion. That like that is what you've just seen." And, and here are the scriptures, and this is how it happens, and here's the cloud, and, and this is how, how it plays out. So pretty uh, pretty amazing. So um, everyone's dreams, everyone's spirit, as, as, uh, uh, as we've been saying, uh, 
uh, the fire in our bones, uh, what we're feeling deep down it is a longing for Zion and the redemption. And and this is not, th and it's being confirmed on multiple levels. We have the level of, of the spirit in our heart, but we also have the, 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 the fact that it's going all over uh, the globe. We have people in Australia. We have people in South Africa. We have people in England. We have people all over the world that are experiencing these exact same things, feeling this longing for Zion. And then the other thing we have on top of it is we also have the words of the living prophets that have said the same thing. We have President Eyring, and we have these words of these living – and uh, uh, President Nelson uh, in a lot of his talks, including his uh, m uh, pretty recent uh, Preparing the World for the, the, the Savior's Second Coming, that Enzyme article provided in April 2020. Um, where they all talk about this, the building of New Jerusalem. President Eyring promised the sisters in uh, the, which will now be the last um, uh, Relief Society conference. Um, that would be the last one, right? So he promised the sisters in the very last. Wow, there's some, there's got to be some simp power in that, doesn't there? Then the very last Relief Society general conference that we're probably going to have ever. President Eyring promised that the daughters and granddaughters that you have raised, past tense, will be the ones at the center of building the new Jerusalem. That's And that was the one of the last things said in one of the last uh, Relief Society conferences. Wow, how did I not pick that one up before? That one's amazing. So um, th there's been that confirmation. And so... Um, that of, of our modern day prophets and apostles saying, you now alive, you now who we're speaking to, the next stage is to get that redemption of Zion in the building of New Jerusalem. And you are going to be that. You are going to, uh, uh, you're going to be at the center of that. So, so yeah, I, I definitely believe that 100%. We definitely have the redemption of Zion and building New Jerusalem, and it is on our doorstep. And we need to get ready for it. We need to humble ourselves now, right? Uh, Abinadi's already gone preaching through the the, the town, and and uh, he's been put to death. And and now Alma's going around trying to gather what's left before uh, before, before departing. That's where I feel like we're at right now. So um, James says, please look at Mick Wick's question. I thought I answered all of his. So all of Mick Wick's questions that had an at in front of me I answered. Was there another one? Oh, okay. just right up here? Okay, so it's not really a question. So he says, or she says, my daughter returned from the Independence Missouri Mission a year or so ago. The church has ended their leases with the farmers in Adam on Diamond area. Hmm. That's not really a question. I can't really answer that. Um, and it's, I, I can't really confirm or deny that. That'd be cool if it was true, but I, I can't confirm or deny that. Um, Matt says, comment, your videos, papers unfold new insights the second and third time around. Things take time to click, star eyes. <laughs> You're very welcome. I hope they do. The average Aussie, which is going to be on here next Saturday, says, uh, Brett's dream was, oh yeah, Brett's dream was amazing. My mind was blown hearing it. When can we expect those, uh, uh, Expect those secret combinations or idolatry papers. Oh my gosh! <laughs> or about judgy judging. Oh my goodness! Yes, I do. I I have probably about six papers that I'm in the process of working and uh, work. Ashley and I have been sleeping on the floor <laughs> for, the, for the last for the last month. Ashley starts work in uh, two weeks, and so come rain or shine, something's happening here. We might be split up for a while. Ashley might be down in the states, and I might be still in Canada. It's so miserable. So uh, tr we're trying to get everything situated. I'm thinking that maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to get, when I when we move into a new place, I'm going to get a boomer desk and get the bookcase behind me and, you know, fill it with just like a bunch of really big, thick books. That you've never read. Huh? That you've never read. That I've never read. Yeah, just fill the bookcase with a bunch of books and, you know, put a couple of like things up there that are like hokey, like a sword or, you know, just something back on the bookcase and then do the rest of my videos w with that so that it'll give me more credibility, more like, you know, you know, boomers will look at it and be like, oh, I like this guy. I like his, ooh, I like that bookcase. A lot of books. 
So uh, maybe maybe when I get to the maybe when I get to my new place, uh, it, you'll have a different look going. Maybe I will do some more video of me actually recording because everyone I don't know what people like more. It's pretty interesting. I just I just want to share the stuff as best as possible. So I guess we'll see. Oh, Aaron says I second Matt's question. Your thoughts on October twenty twenty one general conference? Matt, I your thoughts on this Oh, that wouldn't be. October, oh, this conference coming up. Whoa, geez. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Aaron, I think your ideas were better. <laughs> I think your, your ideas were better, Aaron. I think that, I think they're going to announce the, I think they're going to announce the new Jerusalem. Mm hmm. Yep, I do. I do. Um, I think they're going to announce it. I, you know what? I think that, um, hmm, why don't we stay with what I know? I know that we're out of time. I know we're out of time. I know that uh, the church is getting the church is getting larger and larger, but it sure seems to be getting weaker and weaker. Uh, we seem to be getting more and more members, and we get less and less strength. Um, and so I, 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 I don't see, I don't see this progressing uh, another 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I just don't, I don't see it progressing at this rate uh, with the way things are going. And so I don't, I don't see when people say, uh. We got 50, 60 more years. I don't, I don't know how that's gonna work. Matt sent me a, Matt sent me a link to some LDS YouTuber who thinks we got like 70 more years or something, 50, but he thinks that the Adam on Diamond and New Jerusalem events might be sooner. I agree with that, but um, I, I don't see things progressing any further. And and my Watchman paper, I'm very clear on that. I had and and Aaron actually helped me with this. I had nights where. Um, I felt really anxious and uh, felt like the Lord wanted me to do something or me and Ashley to do something and we just weren't doing it and I couldn't figure it out. And um, I was like, man, we got our food storage. We got this. Like, what, what is it that I need to do? And Aaron shared uh, that Doctrine and Covenants with me that I've, I've heard a million times. But, you know, sometimes when things are shared with you for the million and a one time, it clicks with what you need to have click at that time. And it, it was, you know, those who have been warned, it becometh them to warn their neighbor. And you are not free from the blood of this generation. And I thought, I know that a famine's coming. I know it. And I, I don't know if I've done a good enough job telling my friends and my neighbors and, uh, and warning them. And it's like, it gets so, like, Aaron, it, Aaron is like a beast with this one subject. He's a beast. Like, he just doesn't seem to run out of stamina on this one. But it, for me, this is one, like, most things I, I run out of stamina on. It's like, Mom, have you got your food storage? Yeah, 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 I'll get it in a month. Mom. Have you gotten a food storage? Yeah, 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 I'll get it in a month. Mom, buy it right now. Okay, okay, as soon as I hang up, I'll buy it right now. I call her back another week. Have you? Did you buy it? You, no, I didn't buy it. Mom, get your food storage. It just, it becomes so tiring, just trying to, to get people to, to, to obey this one. I mean, it's just, there is such a reluctance on the part of members to give up their fancy bookcases and... Uh, and uh, you know, lifestyle for for food that sits under the bed that you're sleeping in. Like they don't want to do it. They just don't want to do it. They'd rather spend eighty dollars at Chick Fil A or you know, Chuck -a Rama or Golden Corral, or they'd rather spend a hundred and twenty dollars over at you know the Olive Garden. They'd rather do that than um, spend a hundred twenty dollars on flour that sits under the bed. It's just that's just the way it is. And they really 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 genuinely believe that they can live like that and god is going to take care of them and they also believe that if god doesn't take care of them and they die it doesn't matter they'll still be exalted so when when you have that belief why take action but you know if, if i can eat if i can eat olive garden today and if i can eat taco bell and all this food and live this life that i want right now and my my the consequences for my actions are either a God will rain manna down from heaven and save me, or B, he's going to save me in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom anyway, well, then why wouldn't I just party while I'm here on earth, right? And so it's such a, it's such a hard thing to teach because you have to, you have to tell them to give up a lifestyle that they're not willing to live, give up, and you're also having to tell them that their exaltation has to be, has to be tied to their obedience to this as well, which they don't want to hear. Nobody wants to be told about anything. By the way, you know, uh, exp and by nobody, I mean members of the church. Like, 
stale members, that's like one of the worst things you can teach them. Oh, by the way, um, one of the requirements for exaltation is to open your mouth. All of a sudden, you know, the boomers are have their hair on fire and they're running around in circles. Like, they do not want to hear that. They do not want to hear that there are actual requirements for exaltation. They want to believe that, you know, you just kind of put along and, you know, pay your tithing every once in a while and do your thing and uh, social security will come, right? Like, it'll come. Even if it banks up the country, it's going to come. Like, that. that's just the belief. And so it's really hard. But we did it, you know, and I put it, I put out that paper again, the Watchmen, where it's, where it's like, there is a famine coming. There is a famine coming and um, people are going to die. And it, it's not my words. They're the words of the prophets and apostles for going on a, 150, 200 years. And that's just including the modern ones. That's not including the Book of Mormon. That's not including, you, you know, any of the other standard works. We are going to, we are going to enter that time period. And I, I, uh, and I know that other people have had similar, um, um, similar things being told to them. They need to get their house in order. They need to get their food storage and their their water and, and their stuff taken care of. And I, I thank God for people like Aaron who can keep up the um, enthusiasm and uh, and the fight on that front. Um, because that, that, that's not a, I, I have found that's not a very easy one for me to do. I feel like. I feel like teaching people about the gospel is really easy and straightforward and, and you can kind of drop people and move on and just keep doing something. But it's like, uh, I feel like you get to a point in time where I feel like I'm a, I, I'm a nagging spouse, you know, like mom, did you, did you get your food storage? Hey mom, Hey mom, did you do it? I, I, it's just, it's really hard for me to do it. And I've been, I've been really trying to just be like, I'm going to fight through it and just keep saying, Hey mom, get your food storage. Hey mom, get your food storage. And so, um, my thoughts on October 2021 conference, hey, maybe we'll have a famine starting. Maybe we'll have the the real big hailstorm hit. Maybe we're going to have the uh, announcement of the new Jerusalem. I'm for all that. Um, I But I, I have no idea. I, I thought I had a little bit more idea in the last conference, and I was roughly correct. But I, I have no idea going into this conference. I, I have no feeling. I, I will tell you this, that... When 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 I came out, when I came out and I said, "Oh, that last conference, it's gonna it's gonna have a it's going to test to see how much it, fire people really have in their bones," it, because it, it it was actually a really it was really uh, a lax conference, generally speaking, and people got really upset at me and were like, "No, you can't say that. All conferences are exactly the same." And then my my response is, "Oh, okay. So the conference in which Joseph Smith comes back and teaches is just like all the rest." The conference that Jesus Christ comes back and he's the one speaking, nah, it's just like all the rest of them. There's not one that has a little more meaning, maybe, um, <laughs> a little more power. I, you know, I don't believe there are there are there is a spectrum for conferences, just like there is a spectrum of everything else. And uh, when that conference happened, and I said that people got really upset, but you know what? Look at what happened afterwards. Uh, you saw the enthusiasm for everything drop across the board. Uh, uh, across YouTube and a lot of these places where it was just the enthusiasm for for last day stuff and 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 becoming good saints and and perfecting our lives and the redemption of building New Jerusalem across the board it just seemed to drop drop off and uh, the the facts and the numbers play that out like you just look at look at these uh, look at um, the numbers of this stuff it's just uh, it, it hasn't been good it just hasn't been good the the traffic and all that stuff and that's not just on LDS stuff it also is on uh, conservative stuff so like even even stuff like uh, the blaze or uh, fox news like people just became really detached uh, the, the, this last 6 months people have become really detached and uh, i'm really i'm really happy to have met saints like us like you that have not detached that still have the fire in their bones they're still ready to rock and roll they're still ready to do this um but I've seen I've seen even more drop off. People are talking about how bad it was in COVID. I think it's even worse now. I think that the coming back to church phase was surprisingly even worse. And I think it's because maybe it's because people are going back to church hoping to feel something more. Maybe they're hoping to be like maybe they're hoping to get back to church and go back to the temple. And they're hoping that like to feel this super impressive thing and nothing happens. And and they're having to realize oh, it's that that power that I want to feel is supposed to be coming from within me. <laughs> it's not this environment and I don't have it. And so then they just drop out. I don't know what it is, but it's definitely happening. And so I have no clue what I'm expecting from this conference. I'm just going to come in with some popcorn and sit down and just enjoy it. I have no, at this point in time, unless they start putting some stuff out, like maybe once again, the, uh, 
Like, they, they, they have a Liahona or something that gets put up before it. Unless something like that happens, I have no clue. Or, like, you know, a volcano goes off or an earthquake happens. Uh, you know, something crazy. You know, I, I don't... A war starts. Um, I, I have no thoughts on the next conference. Uh, Prudence Thanksgiving says, uh, makes me feel like the redemption of Zion is a lot closer than we think. I... I know that the redemption of Zion is closer than anybody thinks because I know that the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem deals with the ten virgins. And the ten virgins teaches us that half of the righteous saints weren't ready for it when it happened. And so um, I, I absolutely know that the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem is closer than the saints realize because the ten virgins teaches us that. So. Um, she continues, I want to be at the center with my mom and my daughter so badly with my whole family. And that's the, that is exactly uh, the right kind of attitude, uh, the right spirit. And I hope we all get that. hope we can taste that a little bit um, and then turn it into a real burning fire. Um, some, oh, Loop Dog here says that uh, they reinstituted the Saturday night session. I'm pretty sure that they, they did this order just so that they wouldn't have to deal with... Um, uh, they wouldn't have to deal with the um, uh, fallout from shutting down the the, the Relief Society conference. Because if, if they had just gone out and said, hey, we're replacing Saturday night evening conference with a general conference, then the, the, the storyline would be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints replaces the, the, the special evening for sisters and just turns it into a general conference. That's what the headlines would be. Uh, and and it already was to a degree when when pe then they said I oh, were just going to get rid of both priesthood and relief society. So there were still people that were like, oh, it, it, it they they had to do it at a relief society one. That still happened. So if they had just gone directly to general, people would have lit their hair on fire. So I think that I think this was this was from the get go. I think they knew they were going to close down relief society and, and priesthood and turn it into a general conference. But they didn't they didn't want to say that up front. So they, they first canceled it, they let the steam roll out, and then they they said, and now we're going to be bringing it back as a general conference. I think that's what happened. I think that would happen. that's what happened. <laughs> Average Aussie thinks my boomer desk is funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would love to send you a brand new mic if you're interested better than a bookcase. Huh? You know, I actually told Green Tree actually uh, hated, um, hates my mic. And I told her, I told her, do, do research on any mic you want, send it to me and I will buy it. But she hasn't gotten back to me yet. So if it's the offer still stands green tree, if you find a mic that you like, that you're like, Ooh, I like this one. Send me the, send me the information. I don't care how much it costs. I will buy it and I'll have it for me. Uh, when I get to my boomer desk in uh, Michigan. So. By the time I get to the States, you will be a boomer. <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's true. Oh. Aaron, if I get to the States as a boomer, I'll be happy. I've told Ashley for eight years living here that I'm, they're going to end up burying me out back. I'm never getting out of here. So if I if I get down there when I'm a boomer, I'll be happy. I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll be fine. At least I got down there. Um, But I'll miss the redemption and building a new Jerusalem because it'll happen before I'm a boomer. I'll tell you that. Um, Tom Hawk says, I like following along with your papers. I'm a visual person. So following the text or you on the video or you on the video is best for me. So yeah, some people like the text. So maybe what I'll do is I'll do like a, 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 a pool. Who is that? Tim pool. Maybe I'll do that style where I'll throw my face up in the corner and have the thing there. I don't know. People, people like that. I don't care. I'll put it up for a vote. When I get down there, if people want me to keep reading it on a white paper, I'll do that. If people want to uh, have me do a, a mixture, I'll do that. I just don't, I don't really care. I can't really do it here. I don't have a cam here either. So I'll have to buy a cam and I'll have to buy a mic where I go and the boomer desk. I need it both. I need it all. Um, and some things to put on it. I need some things to put on it. Right. So I need like a king. Maybe I put a kangaroo back there for the Aussies. You know, something like maybe a little flag, you know, sticking to something, you know, just that stuff. Uh, Prudence says, that's my family with food storage, too. Someone in my family believes that he will have manna given to him when the famine comes. It's so sad. Yeah, that's that's exactly what's happening with me. So. 
Yeah, I'm a big fan of Aaron's little things too. You know, Aaron, I was going to ask you, by the way, about your little weekly things that you're putting out there. Uh, if you would mind me stealing them and putting them into a document and sharing it online. Because Aaron is putting out these like weekly um, things that you might not have thought of that would be useful for you in your temporal prep, and it, like shoelaces, which you just mentioned. And, and they're very cool. And, and I was hoping that maybe I could steal that from him and obviously say Aaron put this together or his, what do you call it, Aaron's Tuesday, whatever you called it, Aaron. Steal it and post it for people so that people can see it. Well, let's see what you think about that um, if you'd rather not miss steal it. I, but I really appreciate it. Paper on the key. Okay, so Keller says, paper on the key to the science of the theology by Probably P. Pratt. He talks about communication with spirits and dreams based on faithfulness. That was the first I ever heard of it. I, I don't think there's a question in that. I haven't read that paper, but um, it does sound a little bit like lucid dreaming, which I've talked about on a couple occasions. Um, Mark says, how will the Assyrian put us in bondage slavery? Is it literal chain, whip, hard labor, etc.? Is it more like Babylon bondage, materialism, taxes, addiction, etc.? Um, you know, there, this is this goes back and forth. Brother Hiram Andrus believed that it was actual literal slavery. Could be. Um, I I think that it's a lot more um, um, figurative than people realize. I think people don't realize how much they're a slave right now. I believe that it was um, Chelsea uh, in the Discord shared a page from a book that. President Benson suggested that everyone read, which is none dare call it a conspiracy. And it was 14 ways to know that you're a slave. And so to answer your question, Mark, I would go to that book that President Nelson suggested that we read, none dare call it a conspiracy. Huh? Benson. President Benson, what'd I say? No. Okay, no, not President Nelson. President Benson said read, and that was none dare call it a conspiracy. And read that page. I think it was 14 ways to know that you're a slave. And I, I think that that would answer your question on what I believe the Assyrian is probably going to be doing. Because the Assyrian, the secret combinations, um, that's why we have the Book of Mormon. They're, they're, they're one and the same. Stewart says we can get we can create a conference. We can create a conference, them timeline. What? We can create a conference theme timeline to get an idea of what the Lord is trying to to teach or prepare us. Uh, uh, Reba Cook says, but won't we share food and supplies with even the people who choose not to prepare? Or is it we will share, but those who did prepare will receive the greater blessings? You know, th another interesting thing about this, Reba, during this time period is many, many prophets, including Isaiah and Pratt talking about it, talked about how at this time period that there will begin to be a pillar of fire and a cloud by day over each dwelling place in Zion. And, and there's this individual protection that's provided. I don't know what that means. Does that mean that when if you leave your property, you're no longer protected? Does that mean that people aren't allowed to walk onto your property? Like, if it's there to protect you, doesn't that mean that people aren't coming and going? <laughs> like, that kind of seems like that. What it, what it seems like to me. I, I think that it might be a lot more like an ark situation, right? Where, where Noah got on the ark and the, the door was shut and the door was shut. It didn't say Noah shut it. The Lord shut the ark. It says the Lord shut the ark. The choice wasn't Noah's. And so I, I don't know how much of this will actually be our choice. I, I think that we should always have it in our heart. This is my belief to love and share and be as compassionate as possible with everything. But I don't believe that that will be our choice. I believe if it was Noah's choice, he would have opened the ark and he would have let his daughters into the ark because they were on the outside of the ark. But instead, Jesus shut the ark, made a decision for Noah, and Noah had to listen to, most likely, his daughters drowning on the outside of the ark. So, I, 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 not a pretty picture, but once again, tied to this lecture on faith, the Lord's not going to expect anything less from us than he expected from Noah, than he expected from Abraham, than he expected from Moses, uh, and his people, and, and all those people. He's not going to expect anything less. We have the blessing of being able to read their stories and understand that that might be what's coming for us. A lot of these other people like Noah, like they might not have had as many stories to to to, um, to anchor them and keep them and keep them full of hope and love. We do. And so uh, that's a blessing that we have that a lot of those other people did, did, not, did not have. So I would say we absolutely share our food and supplies with people. Uh, that that's our that's our first um, um, reaction. 
I don't think it's going to come to that, though. I, I just I don't think it's going to come to that. I think that Alma and his group leave, and at that point in time, I, like I don't even think even Aaron at that time would care. Like even Aaron, if if, if which I'm sure he's gonna. I, I haven't scrolled down yet, but I'm sure Aaron's gonna be like, you know, get him a get him a gun and shoot him. But um, even Aaron at that point in time wouldn't care because if if you're in New Jerusalem and you're with a bunch of other people and it's like, and, and it's like. Well, Mike has only got top ramen, and, and Aaron, you know, has got beans, and and some, you know somebody else has I don't know somebody else has I don't know rice, potatoes like something else, and it's like hey, you want to swap? You want to share? I, I, at that point, in time, I don't think Aaron will care. Like I just don't think he would care. Um, the, the the so I don't I think if you're in New Jerusalem, if you're with I don't think I don't think it'll matter. I really don't. I don't think it'll matter. You'll be with other people that are exactly like you that you know aren't going to rip you off, that aren't going to be like, I'm going to take this food and flee. Like, that isn't the type of people who are going to be there. And and I think that the other people will, ha- will uh, uh, have to develop the faith necessary to generate the pillar of fire and the cloud by day over their home like Isaiah says is going to happen. And so at that point in time, you're going to be protected by the Lord in the form of that cloud and that pillar of fire. And so um, at that point in time, I don't think you're going to be leaving the protection of that fire. I would just stay right where I am. So um, that's my thoughts on that. So hopefully that made sense. So we got to get a cam so we can do a video call in. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So he wants to do the 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 uh, the, the cam, average Aussie. But hey, here's the thing, though. I, I, I don't have the Boomer bookcase yet, and I don't have – see, you have a really cool thing, too. You got the uh, – you got the really cool, like light show thing going on. So I need, I'm not, I'm not, I'm come up, I'm gonna have to come up with something. I'm gonna have to come up with something. What? Somebody wants to call in. Scroll up. I missed it. Where? Right here. Where? Oh, Ryan. Yeah, you didn't do the at the two LDS archives right there. Sorry, Ryan, I didn't see it. Um, if you want to call in, yep, be my guest. Just uh, just call me, and I will answer it when I get it, okay? I'll just scroll down here and answer the next questions while I'm waiting for that. I don't know where I am. Whoa. Don't I scroll up too high? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was right here. Uh, thank you for the time tonight. Got to get the kids to bed. Press love. Yep. All right. Love you. Love you, too. You guys rock. Um... Uh, we have a question here that would be great to compile Aaron's tips. Yeah, I agree. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get his permission to, to, to compile that. I think his tips are fantastic. My conference wishes for the prophet to declare tithing and fast offerings are not a substitute for food storage. Too many say, nah, I pay my tithing. I'm covered. Ugh, yeah, I don't like that either. That's gross. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, it's Kelly. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Oh, perfect. How are you guys? Pretty good, pretty good. We're sleeping on floors, but we're about ready to get out of here. (laughs) We're including you in our prayers all the time. So, um, we... We just wanted to call in uh, super quick and just really um, fast talk about an experience that we had. So uh, we had a wonderful week. Um, This week, our oldest um, son is getting ready to receive the priesthood. And uh, one of our other children was actually baptized this week. And so as we were um, just kind of going through and preparing things, um, it just came like really, really strongly about um, President Irene when he gave that talk and he said, you know, the women that you have raised. And um, so our oldest son, we feel that it's our responsibility as parents to have him fully understand the responsibility of, you know, having the priesthood as an 11, 12 year old. And I think it was just really um, such 
an eye opener to us that it's not only uh, the women that have been raised, but it's also our young men and um, just how important that is um, as parents for, for us specifically, like praying to understand each of your children, why they're placed in the family they are. Um, you know, what things are they to learn from you? How are you to prepare them for these, these future roles that they're going to have? And I just kind of felt prompted <laughs> um, to just share that, that anyone who, and I'm going to try to do the invite and the commit so that I don't be banned as a guest, but um, <laughs> I invite anyone who is a parent to pray specifically about your children by name and how you can prepare them for what is to come and um i know for for both ryan and myself we have had very very specific things given to us and shown this is what we need you to teach this child because they will do this. Um, so I commit everyone <laughs> who hears this to pray specifically about your children, specifically, um, I probably said that 15 times, but the young men those young men were saved for this time as well. And our boys are probably more Joseph's boys than we are. And I commit everyone to pray and fast to know what your children will do in the redemption of Zion. And that is what keeps the fire going um, in our family. So I commit you to that. <laughs> yes, I will do it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, oh, I thought you were going to follow up with the rest. I was doing those commitments with the missionaries. Will oh, no. Did I miss this? Oh, uh, so <laughs> I, I know, I know that as I have prayed with my husband, Ryan, that we have experienced blankety blank. Will you, God. will you everyone commit to do the same thing? And then we all go, yes. And then you go, I know as you do that, you will be blessed with exactly the same things that me and Ryan were blessed with. Exactly. There, that's so that's I the know. commitment circle. <laughs> Perfect. Still learning. Still learning. Um, but I, I wanted to call in. <laughs> we Just kind of off the cuff. So thank you for letting me call in. We will definitely do that. I I, I really like that commitment. I like I, every time you two have helped with writing papers. I love your questions and commitments. I think oh those are really good. So. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I, I, yeah. I, I need to do that. Uh, we, me and Ashley need to do that more. To, what do we need to do? So the commitment is we need to pray specifically about our kids and what we need to do to prepare them uh, uh, with the redemption and building of, of Zion and New Jerusalem. Yes, yes, Love absolutely. It. And I can, I can share with you um, our oldest son. Um, he had all 13 articles of faith memorized at eight years old. And the reason that he had that is because of an experience that we had where he was asked questions about, um, you know, the church and people kind of being antagonistic against a kid and, um, you know, those sorts of things. And uh, we came home and we were like, this will never happen again. Um, and so we sat with him 
and worked on it and memorized and scriptures and, you know, all of these sorts of things. And it was amazing to see how people responded to him. They, you know, well, no, that's not true. Blah, blah, blah. Right. And blah, blah, blah. It's not technical. It was spiritual. But, um, you know, that's the kind of things that what if we hadn't prayed to know what he was needed, right? Like, as a mother in Zion, my job is to nurture and care for my children. And how can I nurture and care for them if I don't understand why I was chosen to be their mother? What role they're going to have and why specifically I need to be there for them. Um, and it's just something that for me is is a really strong passion um, of mine. And of course, I'm saying it from like a woman's perspective, but it applies to men as well. Um, you know, you are the head of that eternal family as the father and understanding how you can get your children to where the Lord needs them to be is absolutely something to be focused on. Amen. Amen. I know I can't do another commitment circle on the spot. All right. All right. Well, we're going to. I'll let you do it and I'll drop off. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for calling in Kelly and thank you for the commitment. We're going to we need to all do that more as parents. Yes. Thank you so much. And I hope things go well for you guys move in. Thank you to Ashley um, very much as well. Thank you. You're very welcome. God Bye. bless. God bless. Talk soon. Now, Kelly and Ryan uh, if, uh, have helped us with these firesides many times in the past. I really appreciate uh, their contributions in the paper form. I, I would really like to get Aaron's uh, things as well. So, uh, if, once again, I'll have to, maybe I'll have to steal them from Discord. Um, somebody up here said, what are, what are your thoughts on water? You know, I, I in my paper, Temporal Preparedness, I go over water as well. Uh, my water, I go over just drinking. So, you know, if, if you're going to be washing clothes and, and doing other things, you're going to need more water storage. I go over the bare minimum just to, uh, just to keep you alive drinking. Um, and I, I do go over that math in, in that paper. Um, Aaron uh, and people in Discord will constantly be providing um, links to things in, 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 that are for sale in different states um, for people to purchase, to, to store water in. Somebody just the other day was talking about how there was pickle barrels in one place. There were huge pickle barrels, and they, they bleached it out, and uh, it cost them you know, to store it about 50 cents per gallon. There's plenty of that stuff going on. But, yeah, you definitely need water, um, and I definitely go over that in the paper. You, you, you can't ignore that, and so you got to have water. Something else that I didn't actually include in that temporal preparedness that um, I, I mentioned later and, and I feel like we don't kind of mention enough is olive oil. And, uh, and I kind of feel like I need to mention that one a little bit more. You need to have some olive oil in your, in your food storage. And, and the reason for that is that uh, priesthood blessings of healing cannot be done with anything, any other wa uh, any other oil other than, than olive oil. You can't – with the sacrament, you can substitute. Like if you don't have any bread, you, you could do potato peelings. If you don't, have, uh, you don't have bread, you can do crackers. If you don't have bread, you can do rice, uh, like a little rice kernel. Like you could do something else. Um, it doesn't matter – uh, if you've run out of stuff, unfortunately, uh, as far as the priesthood ordinance is concerned, you have to use pure olive oil. And so, um, you know, the, if you want to, to heal people and have that, 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 uh, uh, blessing in your life, especially when you're going through tough times, um, I would definitely recommend getting a, a container of a pure olive oil, or just maybe even some container set aside that you've labeled with a, uh, um, uh, oil that's been set apart or not so you'll know once the priesthood has actually set that part of that oil apart for healing so I would recommend that too so there's a lot of uh, cool suggestions and cool things that you can purchase um, typically uh, you know 50 cents 
for a gallon is typically what is a really good purchase and uh and you know somewhere between one dollar and uh a dollar fifty per gallon it starts to get you know a little more average so and aaron will can help you if you go to the discord and break down the, those costs for you but you definitely need to start doing those things as well uh dj says what's your answer you would give for the professional argument uh that the book of abraham doesn't match what the facility facsimiles mean um uh, i think that there was actually uh dj there was actually a really good um uh video that somebody linked in the discord about um uh just this about uh, the abraham and the facsimiles wow why well, i didn't know that was our room for me to say um in the discord a very cool very cool videos uh going and talking talking about egypt and all those things i thought it was a very cool video that's how i would answer it professionally um if i was going to answer it professionally you know if i was just going to answer it spiritually you know that would take 20 seconds but as far as professionally if you if you were interested in that um i, I would definitely go to what that that individual was preaching he was a, a professor he spoke multiple languages it was a very very interesting video to watch i um, talking about the endowment and 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 how it related to ancient uh, how it related to ancient egypt it was a really uh really fascinating um a lecture so I, I would recommend that and if you're not in the discord i'd highly recommend getting in there so that it becomes a lot easier to share these things with people via you know a, a resource like this so just get on the discord ask the same question and and somebody will be able to link you to that that video it's a really good one um so hopefully you, you do that Alan says olive oil storage best quality you can find in a dark glass bottle keep in a dark dry place will last 10 plus years <laughs> there you go he knows it Got that on hand. All right, good work. So Brett says here, um, where can we hear about Brett's dream of the redemption design? Um, geez, that was in Wake Up Stories, I believe. So if you go back to the Firesides and, and look up the one that's the Wake Up Stories, uh, you'll have it in there. Uh, you also, uh, if you go on Discord, um, uh, Tracy's actually labeled each one of the Firesides with their topic. And I believe that we're starting to do that on their website as well. So if you're scrolling through our website, it won't have it'll have the date, but it'll also have the topic. So you just scroll through there until you see the topic, wake up stories, and uh, it, it's in that fireside. So there's your answer there. All right, well we've gone two hours and forty minutes. I thought that we were going to end a little bit early, and I, I failed on that one. Is there any other questions here, or are we going to wrap it up? I'll say this as I'm talking. If somebody asks another thing, then we'll do it. But I'll say this as people are thinking about this. Brothers and sisters, I love you. And I'm so grateful for the chance I've had to meet all of you. I know the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet. I know he is a prophet. Not was. I know he is a prophet. And I know he's coming back. And I know that Jesus Christ is coming back. And I know that Abraham's coming back. And I know that Moses is coming back. Because this earth will be Christ's earth and it will be the celestial earth. And we are blessed to be part of, we are blessed to be part of the, 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 the generation, the dispensation, and more specifically, the generation, to be able to bring these things finally into fruition. We're finally going to see these things. We're finally going to see the new Jerusalem. We're finally going to get that, 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 that done. And we're only going to be able to get that done through humbling ourselves now, gaining the knowledge and the faith and and the humility now, that's the only way we're going to be able to have that. And if we don't if we don't do that, then we're going to have to go through tribulations and trials and and humbling experiences until we're finally ready to get that done. Brothers and sisters, I don't want that to happen for us. I, I pray every day now that I will be able to find some way to humble myself. That that these these weaknesses and these these problems that I have, that I will have some way provided me that I can overcome them in in humility being uh, instead of being compelled to be humble I pray every day as Pratt counseled us and uh, the Lord counseled us in Holy Writ pray always that you may escape the things that are going to be shortly coming upon us pray always for those things pray always uh, for that uh, for that uh, uh, for that ability to, to escape that I do that all the time now and I really mean it uh, we really need that now. Um, we have a question here. Any thoughts on the rest of Daniel 12 and 
from the time that the daily sacrifice shall thousand two hundred years. Okay, yeah. Um, that one I answered actually in my very first paper before you begin your last day's timeline journey. So that's actually there. That one's actually that that whole question uh, is actually answered in the LDS student manual, and so that's where you're going to find your answer there. Um, Chelsea says section Micah question. Wait, you know what? I'm writing a paper. I'll hold off. Did I miss something? Well, Sterling, if there was something else in there, uh, I, I might have missed it. Well, brothers and sisters, I love you. You can do this. It's Zion or bust. That's that's the end goal. It's Zion or bust. Saturday, next Saturday is when the next fireside is going to be. It's not going to be the, on a Sunday. So once again, it's not going to be on a Sunday. It will be on Saturday. And it will be um, sometime between 7 and, and we'll post on YouTube a little bit earlier and on Discord just when we, we work it out. But it's going to be around 7 o'clock Central. Okay. But this is a.m. Okay, so um, figure out what time frame you're on. Take it, figure out where that is because it's going to be 7 a.m. Central. Okay, so 7 a.m. Central times uh, Central time is when that's going to take place, which is going to be about 8 o'clock p.m. for the not-so-average Aussies, the two brothers, uh, Topher and um, Ammon, which are going to be joining me. And so, or I'll be joining them, whichever way. We'll figure it out. So that that's going to be happening this next Saturday. Sorry. Uh, sorry, it's for Section 101. I'll hold off. Okay. We love you. Zion or bust, baby. I agree. Let's get our life in order. Let's have faith as the brother of Jared. Let's learn these attributes. Remember what, what were they? Can we remember them? Kingdom first. Kingdom first. Zion or bust. Kingdom first. Jesus and Joseph. Meet me there. Okay, so meet me there. Cash me outside. So what are the first two? Kingdom first. K, knowledge. F, faith or power. G, jo, Jesus and Joseph. Judgment and justice. Uh, meet me there. M, T, mercy and truth. Those are the attributes. So find a way to memorize them. Find a way to, to internalize them. We need these things in order to exercise faith undead life and salvation. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless. Godspeed. Keep the faith. We'll talk to you again really soon. Bye.